Okay. Okay, Sergeant Martinez, you may begin. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To dis minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. At this time, Chair Koo, would you please begin your opening statement? Huh. I'm yeah. Hi, I'm Councilman Peter Ku. I want to welcome everyone to this uh, committee meet, uh, public hearing. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to welcome you to our virtual hearing on the issue of how the COVID-19 pandemic highlights inequity in New York City's park system. To understand this issue, we have to begin with a little history. For most of the 20th century, the city properly funded its green spaces, helping to make it the nation's premier park system. In the 1960s, the city devoted a health, healthy one and a half percent of its budget to the parks department. But the financial crisis of the 1970s forced large cutbacks. By the late 1980s, the park's budget had fallen to just 0.86% of the budget, with the resulting being that many city parks turned into places which many New Yorkers try to avoid due to poor budgets and maintenance. This resulted in conservancies being formed to supplement public funds with private money for parks. The result has been that many large and well-known parks saw a big turnaround in their status and once again become attractive recreational sites for city residents and visitors to the city. However, while the reliance on private funding and conservancies increased, public funding remained stagnant for many years. Public funding consistently averages much less than 1% of the whole city budget. Even with last year's fiscal 2020 budget, which was the largest ever in terms of the dollar amount, at about $580 million, it still only, represent, it still only represented 0.6% of the entire expense budget. Of course, we all know that this fiscal year, the upward trend has reversed due to economic hardship resulting from the pandemic. In fact, not only is the public budget at risk, but even private funding is threatened with conservancies and other similar organizations having reported their re uh, revenue, which relies on donations, may decrease to 60% this year. The situation is dire, but now is the time to rethink how we can use this as an opportunity to re-envision how our past systems can operate. The long-term result of this 
is that we have seen a disparity in how larger parks that have access to private funding and other resources do much better than smaller neighborhood parks in lower income neighborhoods. They have to rely only on public funding. While the council and the administration in recent years have recognized and sought to correct this disparity with the implementation of the Community Parks Initiative and Anchor Parks Initiative and the desire to increase the parks budget. COVID has highlighted how access to parks and open space is still not equitable across the city. We all know how critical parks are to well-being of our city. Parks are, criti are critical for health and wellness because they improve physical health and help to reduce anxiety, stress, and depression. Back in March, when the various lockdown protocols started to close off New Yorkers to so many aspects of city life, our parks were one of the only resources that people were able to use to attain some sort of recreation. As the weather warmed in the spring and summer, New Yorkers who were isolated indoors for so many months, praised to use their parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, courts, pools, and beaches once again. In fact, it's well known that park use has increased tremendously during the pandemic. Despite the obvious desire and need for quality open space, recent reports have shown that in many low-income neighborhoods and communities of color, where cases and death rates and from COVID-19 were disproportionately high, residents lack access to quality open space. In fact, more than 1.1 million New Yorkers did not have access to a park within a 10 minute walk of home, where when playgrounds fields and clocks were closed. To highlight this, the average size of parkland in the city is only about 6.4 acres in low income neighborhoods, compared with 14 acres in wealthier neighborhoods. Further, the average park size is 7.9 acres in predominantly black neighborhoods, compared with 29.8 acres in predominantly white neighborhoods. Parks that serve no income areas serve more people per acre than those in high income areas. I think we can, we can and should do better than this. Let me repeat that. I think we can and should do better than this. There are many great ideas out there that seek to improve equity all of which I hope to explore today. Some of these include vastly increasing the park's budget, increasing public private partnerships, building new parks in areas that are in need, expanding the open streets program, expanding community parks initiative, ensuring that money raised through parks conceptions goes back directly to parks and encouraging the target of philanthropy donations to, to benefit a broader range of parks. COVID has made it more apparent than ever. High quality parks, no, I'm sorry, high, uh, no, high quality parks and open space in disadvantaged communities require creative and wide ranging proposals to unlock different types of government and private funding sources. We need ways to increase the access and the amount of open space available for neighborhoods across the city. I hope we can use this hearing and make a better equitable park system. 
a virality a reality items Everyone, please hold on for one second. We have a few technical issues that we're just, just trying to correct. Thank you for one. Thank you. Hello? Can you can you hear me now? Yes, you're loud and clear, sir. Okay. So I'm going to turn over to committee to com I'm going to turn it over to our committee council, Chris Satori, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling, during the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will be first hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question by the, of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function. and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Also, please note that all panelists, aside, aside from those from the Parks Department, will be limited to a three minute time limit so that we may more easily accommodate all who have registered to speak. When called to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now be hearing testimony from the Department of Parks and Recreation. We will hear from Commissioner Mitchell Silver and Deputy Commissioner for Planning and Development, Alyssa Cobb Conan, Matt Jury, Director of Government Relations, and Bruce Thomas, Deputy Director of Government Relations, will also be present to ask questions as well. At this time, I would just like to acknowledge a few of the council members who are members of the Parks Committee who have joined. Uh, council members Levine, Jonai, Morelli, Colin Rivera, and council members Adams, Brannon, Holden, and Ulrich. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the Parks Department. I would ask each of you to please raise your hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions. I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, I will invite council, uh, Commissioner Silver, excuse me, to present his testimony. Thank you. And good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the Parks Committee. 
Uh, I hope your family and you are well during these difficult times and considering the circumstances. I'm Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined by Deputy Commissioner Alyssa Cobb Conan and members of our government relations team. We are very pleased to be here today to discuss equity as it relates to our city, parks, and open spaces. As you will hear, equity is a centrally vital principle that informs all of our strategic and operational decisions, and we thank the Council for convening this important hearing. To provide a quick overview, New York City Parks is a steward of over 30,000 acres of parkland, 14% of the city's landmass, including 10,000 acres of natural area. We oversee nearly 4,500 individual properties, including parks, playgrounds, and community gardens. We operate more than 800 athletic fields and nearly 1,000 playgrounds, 67 pools, 48 recreation facilities, 17 nature centers, and 14 miles of public beaches. Equity to me means one word, fairness. Is every New Yorker being treated fairly when it comes to the resources being allocated to our parks? The mayor entrusted me to make sure that all New Yorkers across the city are being provided with access to first rate amenities in their neighborhood and in their borough. One of our first actions under this administration was to develop a strategic framework, which we called Framework for an Equitable Future, investing over half a billion dollars in several major capital expense initiatives. We also incorporate a data-driven approach to resource allocation and have developed creative strategies to increase park access to parks and playground amenities across the city. With regard to capital investments, I'd like to briefly discuss three landmark programs launched during this administration, the Community Parks Initiative, Anchor Parks, and Parks Without Borders. Launched in 2014, the Community Parks Initiative is New York City's first equity-driven parks initiative and is based on a community and data-driven process. Through internal analysis, we identified several parks and neighborhood playgrounds that have not received a dime of investment in over two decades, an entire generation's younger years, and that simply was not fair. Through CPI, over $300 million has been invested to reimagine and rebuild 67 previously overlooked parks in neighborhoods demonstrating the highest need with high poverty, density, and population growth, effectively improving the quality of life for nearly half a million people who live within a walk of these parks. To date, we have completed 50 of these incredible reconstructions with the remaining 17 either in active construction or procurement. The parks, which had suffered underinvestment for decades, were redesigned and truly transformed with an eye toward longevity and sustainability, offering amenities that appeal to park goers of all ages with features that can adapt to a changing climate. With our grassroots engagement, staff at our Partnership for Parks, we are working with existing and new stakeholders around CPI capital sites with the goal of cultivating community partners at every capital project site to sustain these reconstructed parks. To date, we have supported 71 community partners at our CPI capital sites and have supported over 1,900 park beautification projects. Of course, these efforts are ongoing, and during COVID, we have offered volunteer training online and aligned in-person volunteer events with high priority areas for maintenance. The positive response to the Community Parks Initiative has been overwhelming, especially as more and more of the projects come back online and these communities are fully enjoying these public spaces once again. We are especially honored when the American Planning Association awarded its 2020 National Planning Excellence Award for Advancing Diversity and Social Change to the Community Parks Initiative, recognizing its transformative impact. Our Anchor Parks and Parks of Borders program are additional tools in our equity and access toolbox that we have utilized, delivering very positive results. Through Anchor Parks, the city has invested a further 200 million in investment in large community anchoring parks in each borough. 
Through Parks at Our Borders, we are creating new design approaches, focusing on improving the areas where parks and neighborhoods meet, maximizing public access to the property that is already within the public realm so that all New Yorkers can fully enjoy these spaces. The signature projects embodying this approach were chosen with inclusivity and fairness in mind. And we took input online and in dozen, dozens of listening sessions across the city to best identify where this design approach would be most beneficial. Turning to operational and programming approaches, New York City Parks has invested to help sustain healthy, active, and safe communities. We made recreation center membership free for our youth. We lowered the cost of membership for younger adults, people with disabilities, seniors, and veterans providing vulnerable demographics with greater access to more amenities. We diversified our programming with activities like kids in motion sites, natural classroom programs, shape up classes, and mobile movies to provide much needed activities and entertainment for children and their families. We partnered with the New York City Council to expand programming in a variety of different neighborhoods. One of our more popular recent accomplishments has been the Cool Pools program, which made its first splash in 2018 amongst our pool goers. Over the past two years, we were able to dramatically overhaul 11 pools across the city with updated deck furniture, vibrant decor, and fun activities, making them more than just public facilities, but resort style destinations in the community. Many New Yorkers depend on these pools as their primary recreational outlet during warmer months. So it was only fair that we could fully enjoy these opportunities to escape the city heat, which can be considerable due to the urban heat island effect. Indeed, Early in this administration, we found out that some of our vulnerable populations live in neighborhoods that have suffered disproportionately from climate-driven increases in urban heat. And many of these neighborhoods do not enjoy their share of the benefits from the city's tree canopy. Our city trees are vital infrastructure that provide countless benefits, shade and heat reduction, stormwater capture, carbon reduction, and property value increases to name a few. And New Yorkers were not benefiting equally. Simply, it wasn't fair. To rectify that, the administration launched its Cool Neighborhoods Initiative, and New York City Parks has specifically been providing over $82 million in additional street tree plantings, equitably targeting neighborhoods with a high heat vulnerability index scores where the benefits of these trees are sorely needed. The best way to maintain an equitable system is through common sense, data-driven approaches. It is important to make sure that people have access to open space, so we use open space ratios and walk to the park metrics to guide our planning efforts and identify neighborhoods that are greatest in need of green space. We partner with other agencies like the Department of Education, the New York City Housing Authority to improve and increase access to some of their recreational spaces for the public through the schoolyards to playgrounds program and our NYCHA campus improvements. It is also important to make sure that parks or open spaces are well maintained, which is why we rely on our parks inspection program to identify the most high need priorities and make sure that resources are allocated to them. We must be creative discussing and expanding our open spaces uh, because many of the challenges come when we look to acquire new land. Vacant and underutilized land is extremely scarce, and the complexity and duration of the city's land use review process for each parcel often discourages property owners who might otherwise be willing to sell it to the city. However, we remain dedicated to exploring every opportunity to add new sites to our portfolio and have successfully done so during this administration including Brookfield Park in Staten Island, Chelsea Green in Manhattan, and other additional portions of the Bushwick Inlet Park in Brooklyn. Equity serves as a guiding principle for our internal practices of the agency as well. I was proud to elevate our equal opportunity officer position to an assistant commissioner level in 2015, the first New York City agency to do so, to ensure that our dedication to equity 
and fairness includes our internal hiring and promotion practices. We also envision our Parks Opportunity Program, the partnership with the Human Resource Administration, upgrading training and uniforms to make sure that our job training participants are recognized as part of the Parks family while they gain skills and seek permanent employment opportunities. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been forced to make some adjustments to our protocols and practices due to the safety and practical concerns. But our commitment to fairness for all of this has remained the same. We first and foremost provided a safe environment for our workers. We recognized early that New Yorkers were going to need recreational outset, outlets while sheltering in place. So we worked tirelessly to provide outlets for those who could safely travel to a park as well as those who felt more comfortable at home. For our staff, who I thank again for their efforts throughout COVID-19 crisis, we provided them with a variety of resources so that they could tend to their work in a safe manner. In addition, following the city and state health directives, we, we offered uh, the necessary personal protective equipment, implemented flexible and staggered scheduling for essential workers, adapted our vehicle policy to promote social distancing and introduced robust cleaning protocol for our facilities. For those traveling to parks, we worked with the Department of Health to provide nearly 8,000 face coverings at multiple sites around the city. Following state and local guidance, we kept as many properties open as we could, closing only those necessary to keep people safe during the peak of the virus earlier this year. Our parks enforcement patrol and our parks ambassadors from our public programs and recreation have also worked with our fellow city agencies to manage overcrowding and educate our park guests on proper social distancing so people could be safe and feel safe when going out to their local park. The seismic impact of the global COVID-19 pandemic resulted in very severe cuts for our agency in the FY21 adopted budget. The cascading effects of those cuts led to the cancellation of hiring 1,700 seasonal maintenance and operation workers that are normally brought on each summer to work on borough MO crews, cleaning parks, and attending other horticultural and maintenance duties. The absence of these seasonal workers have been deeply felt this summer. By New York City Parks, we remain committed to marshalling its resources in the most effective manner as possible to deliver core services to keep our city parks clean and safe. To be proactive, our agency is initiating a comprehensive review of our litter and trash management practices in anticipation of continued staffing challenges in next year's peak season. We have also launched a robust public education campaign reminding all park owners to do their part so we can all continue to enjoy our shared public space and have engaged with many elected officials on organizing cleanup events with our partnership with park staff and our borough operation teams. As you've heard today, the commitment to equity is centrally important to all of us at New York City Parks. And we recognize how we work uh, to do the impacts every single, that impacts every single resident and visitor to New York City. Our parks are for everyone. So we will do as much as our resources can provide in order to make sure that everyone gets the opportunity to enjoy the best possible park system we can offer to them. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to testify today, and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. And before we continue, I'm just going to re-administer the vote to Deputy Commissioner Conan and Bruce Thomas because we did not get their replies earlier. So I'll just go ahead with that again. Once again, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond to council member questions, honestly, Deputy Commissioner? I do. Uh, Mr. Tops? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And at this point, we will proceed with questions from Chair Koo. Chair Koo, um, you may begin your questions. <clears throat> Hi, Commissioner. Thank you for coming to give a uh, testimony about uh, inequity of parks. Can you hear me? 
I can hear you. I can hear you. It's okay. Yes, Councilmember. Okay, okay. Well, because I have, uh, oh, at the last minute, my home I Wi-Fi died. You know? So I had to borrow some Wi-Fi in the basement of uh, other business people. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you. So my first question is: Many reports have indicated that part use have increased tremendously during the pandemic. Does DPR have any data to indicate by how much utilization increase? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chair Ku. Uh, we do record numbers for our pools and beaches, but for our other parks, we do not have a mechanism of recording usage. But what we've noticed from all our social distance ambassadors, with everything else closed, we have seen increased uses of our parks across the entire system. I think we all know with all the sheltering in place and not many of uh, all the things that we're used to being open from movie theaters to malls, parks became the destination for basically all New Yorkers. Uh, whether it was a birthday party, fitness classes, uh, uh, shower, baby showers, parks became the destination and we did see a lot more usership in our parks. But in terms of the actual numbers, we, did have, we do have those numbers for our pools and beaches but not for our overall park system. But I think any observer driving, to, driving throughout the city or walking throughout the city or biking could see clearly parks were heavily used uh, throughout the summer. Thank you, yeah. So it's often mentioned that the number of visitors going to parks has been increasing in recent years. Uh, what is the process for actually measuring the number of people visiting each park? Uh, I may defer to Deputy Commissioner uh, Cobb Conan. Uh, we started an effort uh, to determine different techniques of how do you count people within parks. I think we called it Park Core, and it was a pilot program we started a couple of years ago uh, that we're looking at various techniques of how do you count people uh, in parks. Uh, so I'll defer to uh, the Deputy Commissioner to add a bit more about that effort. Uh, I think we did kind of hold it during COVID, uh, but we were looking at ways of looking at cell phone data uh, of determining how many people are in a public space. Uh, but we do have accurate numbers for parks, I'm sorry, for beaches and pools, but for the parks, we were looking at some technology that would better be able to track how many people are in a park. Of course, they need to have their cell phone on. Uh, Deputy Commissioner? Yes, thank you. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, we, we, don't, we have limited data on a system-wide basis of usership. We also have some usership based from uh, conservancy efforts within those parks. Um, the wonderful thing about city parks is that they're porous and have multiple entrances and exits, which makes it challenging to measure usership on a system-wide basis. Um, unlike, say, an institution like a museum where there's one door in and out. Right. We have been looking at methodologies, uh, which does require technology. Um, it is something that um, you need to make sure that you're balancing cost and privacy with, um, with how you do that. And we, as the commissioner mentioned, we did get a community development block grant uh, funding to look at um, Prospect Park to, uh, to, to pilot uh, methodologies for implementation. Again, looking at um, a system-wide or perhaps um, a, um, a selective sample of parks across the system. And that's in process. And Thank I was, you. And we did do an attempt a few years ago, we relied heavily on our Conservancy Park partners. We estimated that New Yorker, that New York Parks gets over 130 million visits, not visitors, but visits to our park system every year. Central Park is 42 million alone. So that gives you a sense of how often New Yorkers, and that includes visitors, is the number of visits we get in our parks. So it exceeds over 130 million. Thank you. So I think it's important for us to have a, a system to measure you know, how many visitors to each park, especially the major ones. Uh, in, in, in the times of this uh, technology, uh, you shouldn't be a, a, such a big problem. No? So, uh, Commissioner, prior to a pandemic, what was the percentage of New Yorkers who had access to a park within a 10-minute walk from their homes? 
Uh, the number right now is 81.7%. Uh, our goal is to get to 85% by 2030. So it's 81.7% as of today. So does that mean more than 1 million people did not have access to any public park within a 10 million walk? Uh, that is correct. Uh, they didn't have a walk to a park. Now, 10 minutes, it depends how quickly someone walks. So we just say walk to a park because someone who walks fast and someone who walks slow. So walk to a park, but correct, that is correct. And that is something we constantly work on. As I mentioned in my testimony, we do have those walk gaps. We know where they're located and we're doing a number of things to make sure we can reduce that gap. There is funding to convert schoolyards to playgrounds. That's our partnership with the Department of Education. And now we have a couple of projects with NYCHA uh, to re-envision their public spaces to make it more accessible, particularly where we're seeing that that walk again. So this is something that we've increased over time. This administration has been focused on uh, both those programs and reducing uh, the, the gap. And uh, so that's something we're very pleased of. But the answer, yes, is 81.7%. And we'd like to get to 85% by 2030. Commissioner, perhaps I could add that um, New York City looks at what we call the walk to the park in a, in a way that's um, perhaps more con conservative or, or stricter than, than other, other cities. Um, if, you, if you look at our walk score uh, it, what, in terms of how, how far people are away from a park, if it's a 10 minute walk, we actually do quite well. I'm not sure I have the number in front of me, but I think it's at 97 or 99% within a walk to a park. But we look at it um, with a finer grain perspective. We look at whether or not people are outside of a, a walk to a park uh, based on the following criteria. One is, are they outside of a walk to a park if it's 10 minutes away from a large park or a half mile? And if it's a small park, then we use a more conservative metric, which is a quarter mile. Um, and so that's why we're at 80, 81.7% of New Yorkers within a walk to a park. Eric, who you're on mute, okay. Thank you. So uh, what measures does D, uh, DPR have in place to clean and sterilize recreation centers? Well, as part of our COVID protocol, uh, many of our rec centers are closed. However, we did use them for a number of functions we did have cleaning protocol for our facilities. We use some of our facilities uh, for food distribution. Uh, we use some of our facilities uh, for test and trace. And now we're using it for daycare and the learning bridges. In all cases, we have very strict cleaning protocols, which we started at the beginning of COVID. But in terms of the rest of our recreational facilities open to the public, they're not based upon uh, the, the exceptions I just shared with you. But as I said, in all those cases, we had very, very, uh, clear and strict cleaning protocols for all of our indoor facilities. So uh, many recreation centers are being used for the learning bridges program. And it has been mentioned that only one person is assigned to clean several facilities and the facilities are only cleaned once a day. Uh, is this correct? I'd have to get back to you. That does not sound correct, but I want to get back to you to confirm. As right. I stated, uh, we know if there is a population of people in the facility, uh, we take our cleaning protocol very, very seriously. And so that's something I'd have to get back to you. It does not sound correct, but I want to be able to confirm. Thank you, yeah. Do you have a breakdown of the number of location of recreation centers they are used for the learning bridges program. 
We can get to the location. Uh, I'll see if I have that here. Uh, we have, I, if you want me to go through each one in Manhattan, we have Alfred E. Smith and Jackie Robinson rec centers in Brooklyn, Sunset Park uh, in Queens, uh, we have LBH. Uh, the ones that are in progress, we're now looking at Tony Dapolito, Tom Jeff, Jay Hood, East 54th Street, Hansborough, Gertrude Edelie in Queens, uh, Al Order, Arrow, and Detective Williams in Brooklyn, Fort Hamilton, St. John's and McCarran, in Bronx, St. Mary's, Hunts Point, West Bronx, Williams Bridge, Overall, and in Staten Island, Greenbelt and Walker Park. Thank you. There's a lot, yeah. It is a lot. There are 23 so, recreation sites yeah. being offered. How many in Queens? I, I forgot. So we have 23. There are some licenses in progress, uh, but in total, we're looking at 23 recreation sites. Uh, and stable, so I missed some. Well, there were 23. We can certainly send you the specific lists. Those are license sites, and those licenses, they're in progress. So we can certainly send you the list. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. My Wi-Fi is very stable. I'm sorry, Chair, you're, you're breaking up a bit. My last response was we can send Yeah, you now I understand. Yes, we'll send okay. you a list of the 23 sites. Yeah, now I understand we not only have the inequity of parks, we have the inequity of Wi-Fi, you know, in New York City. <laughs> so when you have unstable Wi-Fi, you know, the school kids cannot do their homework or they cannot learn properly. So well, the good news that. is uh, we have an amazing um, technology team and they made sure all of our Wi-Fi and all the schools for our learning bridges was up to date. So they did that relatively quickly. So uh, uh, we do have a great team making sure that that does not come a barrier to those children learning. Okay, now let's see. Uh, another question is there has been Many capital projects that have been stopped during the pandemic and have yet to restart. In what neighborhoods are these uh, halted projects located? How many stop projects uh, in, in, what, in what neighborhoods? Well, that's something that's very specific. I'll have to get back to you, uh, but you, I'm sure, uh, Chair, you understand that under the pause, it was initiated by the governor and that many park projects did come to a halt. We have resumed many, uh, and we're working constructively with OMB and other relevant agencies in order to get those projects back on track. Uh, I do not have before me uh, the, the final numbers since we're working with OMB on a daily basis uh, or the locations, but that's something we can certainly uh, work with our capital team and get back to you. Uh, but the good news is uh, a number of projects have proceeded and we're now having these virtual ribbon cuttings uh, to let the public know that now those projects are moving forward and we continue to cut ribbons on those projects. But we'll certainly get to those the specific numbers of the, both the number and the location. Okay. Does, does DPR perform the inspections as per its past, uh, as per its past inspection program, PIP? Yes. Uh, all parks run by the conservancies? Uh, the answer is yes. So our parks inspection program continues. Our inspectors are out there still, still conducting those inspections. That is ongoing. And clearly, uh, as we've saw increased usage to our parks, uh, those inspections and those ratings are so critically important. So the program continues. Inspectors are still out there. Uh, and we're still monitoring those numbers uh, on a monthly basis. So the answer is yes. Which conservancy, uh, one parks, or parks of such parks, if any, have performed poorly under the PIP program? 
Uh, I don't think any of the parks perform poorly. We have uh, mayor's management targets and uh, on a regular basis, we meet or exceed those targets. Now within that range, there are some at 100% and some may be at the 85%. Then there's no question over the summer uh, with the reduction of not having as many seasonal, we did see a reduction in numbers across the board. But in general, all of the parks, whether you're a conservancy park or a non-conservancy park, what, uh, are still uh, performed well. However, we did see a dip in ratings this summer, uh, which was directly correlated uh, to not having the 1700 seasonals in our parks. So considering uh, staff did a great job, the public and volunteers stepped in, we initiated that campaign, carry in, carry out, and reached out to all of our partners uh, to help us make sure our parks were well maintained. And I see a number of partners on this call I cannot tell you how invaluable their help has been. This past Saturday, over 60 groups came out for It's My Parks Day. And so between both our conservancy partners, our park staff, and all of our volunteers, we're really working hard to make sure these green spaces stay safe and clean. Yes, yes, Chair Ku, I'm here. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so how has COVID impacted the inspections and data related to inspections? COVID has not impacted our inspections, our inspectors. Uh, we did initiate protocol for how people travel, but the inspectors generally travel alone. So in terms of the inspections, it hasn't been affected uh, in terms of their ability to do their work. Uh, clearly, um, in a certain part of the year, some of our facilities were closed, uh, but still uh, they were able to go out there and do their work. It's critical and vital to this agency because that guides us into where we have to make adjustments should we see a drop in ratings or some issue we need to pay attention to. Part of their work is identify what we call immediate action if we see something wrong out there in the field, they have, our staff has a certain amount of time to fix it. So the parks and inspection program is vital to the safety of our parks. So we did not suspend it and through COVID, they continue to inspect the parks. So uh, what parts have been flagged through the PIP program as not having, uh, as not meeting the standards set by the department? We did see as a result of, uh, because of budget reasons of having less 1700 seasonal workers, uh, we were not able to, we made 40% less visits to our parks than we had in the previous year. That did have an impact. Uh, we all recognize, uh, as you stated, uh, the very devastating loss in revenue and budget cuts did affect our operations. So we did see a 40% reduction across our system. And so that became very challenging that did in fact affect our ratings. And so we have always exceeded or maintained all of our park ratings as long as I've been here. Uh, but the law, having, not having the 1700 seasonal workers did have an impact at a time when park usage was increasing and more people were coming there for social events, for food. And so I have to really applaud staff and the volunteers for really stepping up. So at a time you saw less staff cleaning our parks you saw an increase in park usage. And so many of our park partners, you know, Prospect Park, Riverside, and I can name so many, started to initiate carry in, carry out, and really started to pay attention because they saw what was happening to our parks. So yes, uh, we did see a change in reduction uh, in our park um, uh, cleaning, but uh, at the same time, we saw an increase in park usage. It has stabilized now that we're in the fall season. But as I stated in my testimony, we're looking very carefully at the spring season, where we're moving into our other peak. We're now thinking of very comprehensive and creative ways of approaching both our litter and trash maintenance to anticipate what may happen come March when the weather starts to change again. Thank you. 
We are also joined by council members Moya and Please hold for one second, everybody, as we correct some technical issues. Commissioner, did you hear my last? No, I did not, uh, Chair Crow. Uh, so More like Chair Ku, the audio is going in and out. Um, I did not hear the question. You, know, you have to unmute yourself, Mr. Chair. I'm going to stop and ask, let other council members ask questions and then switch to a telephone. Uh, thank you, Chair Ku. Um, as the chair was saying before, we were joined by two additional council members, council members Moya and Van Bramer. Um, at this point, we will move on to additional council members who may have questions. Uh, I, um, and we will ask them to uh, raise their questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand functions. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, council members, and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin, begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin delivering your testimony. We will first hear from Council Member Levine followed by Council Member Joni. Time starts now. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to Chair Ku for holding this hearing and for applying an equity lens to these critical questions. We might not have comprehensive data yet, but there's no doubt park use is surging, maybe at record levels, we see it all over the city. But this is happening even more in low income communities in black and brown neighborhoods where most residents don't have the resources to retreat to a cabin in the woods to ride out the pandemic or to go to the Hamptons. And um, parks really have just been critical to livability in these neighborhoods all over the city during these difficult times. And so that makes the resource squeeze uh, particularly difficult in low resource neighborhoods around the city, both from the expense side and the capital side. And um, I do wanna commend you and your team, Commissioner Silver, for uh, finding ways to do more with less in this difficult time uh, at a certain point uh, eventually, you're going to have to do less with less. We understand that's how budgets and staffing work. If, uh, if I have time in my five minutes, I will, I'll ask you more about the expense side. But on the capital front, I just want to understand the extent to which you have restarted Park's capital work, which I know had paused during the early stage of the pandemic, and the, ex the extent to which you are dispersing funding for nonprofits to do capital work in parks. Uh, I believe there's about 50 million pending in that category as well. Uh, well, I well, thank you for the question, Council Member, and thank you. Um, I do applaud also our park workers. Wow, this has been a very trying time. Um, I will get to the specific numbers. Uh, you're correct. Uh, we had quite a number of projects in all phases. We had well over 600 projects 
we have designed procurement construction. Uh, and I got, I will get you the numbers of exactly how many were unpaused and continue going forward. Uh, we went in tranches to OMB and we continue to do that on a daily basis. Uh, I, I don't have the response on specifically about our nonprofit partners. Uh, so that's something I don't have before me, but uh, Council Member Levine will certainly get that information for you. But the good news is we're getting more and more of those projects unpaused on a weekly basis uh, because we know how important it is to get these spaces open to the public as quickly as possible. That's great. I mean, the nonprofit partners, in many cases, maybe most, really are focusing in low-income neighborhoods. And so uh, their parks work uh, is also critical to equity. And um, to get it started as soon as possible, I think, is really important. So would appreciate your update on that. Um, uh, speaking of equity and the impending elections of uh, a week and a half, I want to ask you about uh, the concessions that the Trump Organization operates, um, three in Central Park and one, of course, the golf course in the Bronx. Uh, am I correct that those are expiring soon? I believe in mid, the three in Central Park are expiring in mid-2021. I do believe the concessions in Central Park are expiring soon. The Ferry Point Golf Course is not. I don't have the specific dates, but you are correct. Uh, those concessions in Central Park uh, are expiring soon. And have you opened um, solicitations for the next phase of those contracts, the two ice rinks and the carousel in Central Park? To my knowledge, we have not. So do you know, so that presumably then we don't know whether the Trump organization intends on reapplying? Uh, we do not. I, I, you know that I've been on the record advocating for the cancellation of those contracts. Uh, at this point, we're nearing the, the end of that term. So now my fight is going to be to make sure that they are not renewed. Um, do, does the city have a commitment to um, uh, offering those important concessions to an organization that is not uh, owned and operated by Donald Trump? With all of our concessions, we put it out there and let people respond. And so that's something we've always done, even if there's an operator that have been used, that have been operating a concession for a long period of time. So that is our intention. Uh, we're looking very carefully at those concessions. We do know they're expiring soon. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's a given that if you're a current operator today, that it's automatic, you become the concessionaire, you get the concession in the future. Do, do you know, uh, there's been some reports that revenue has been down at those concessions, which means that the city's take also drops because uh, that's the way the agreement works. Do you know if that's the case? Well, let me respond. I'll let the deputy commissioner uh, respond as well. There's no question we've been seeing a drop in revenue across the city. Uh, they've all been challenged. Some took a while to reopen. And I think we all know that we rely heavily, not just on concessions for revenue, but the concessions- I'm for expired. Park experience. So I'm now gonna just turn it over to the deputy commissioner. So if you wanna add anything on both the concessions in Central Park, but I can tell you revenue has been down for our concessions. That's correct, commissioner. The con concession revenue has been down across the board. Um, we can certainly follow up on any individual concession that you'd like more information on. Well, there had, my time is up, but the, there had been reports uh, in the press that uh, specifically the Trump operated concessions were seeing a drop in revenue well before the pandemic, possibly because of, 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 of how tarnished the, the reputation of the Trump name is. And that's, of course, bad for the city because we rely on that revenue. Um, is, is, it, is it the case that those properties were seeing a drop in revenue prior to the pandemic? I'd have to go back and, and look at that. Uh, I don't want to misspeak. Okay. My time is up. Um, thank you again, um, Commissioner Silver, and to all the women and men of the Parks Department who have been doing such great work during this difficult crisis. Thank you. And back to you, Chaco. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Jonai, followed by Council Member Adams and Council Member Moya. Time starts now. Thank you. I want to thank the chair and the commissioner. I hope all is well with you and your family. And I can't help but give a uh, shout out to my commissioner, Iris Rodriguez. She's awesome, or as my children would say, the best assist. Keep that in mind. But with that being said, I'm so concerned. Prior to COVID, and prior to uh, any economic downturn, we still had parks that were not being maintained. 
or the upkeep, uh, capital, uh, basic maintenance and cleanup, grass cutting, in particular when it comes to small pocket parks, isolated parks that are seldom seen and not very visited. Um, we all expect, and the experts predict, a continued downturn uh, in our economy. You witnessed, we've all witnessed, a 1,700 staff cut in this last budget to the Parks Department. I'm concerned, just like you and most of New Yorkers, over the future of the parks and the maintenance. You're looking for other sources of revenue. I would only imagine that would be a dedicated source if concession, is concession money, first of all, gone, go directly to the Parks Department budget? Or is that put into a pool? The, if there is a concession in a park that we have a license agreement, there's a formula where the revenue is split. If it is a concession in a non-license agreement part, then it goes to the city's general fund. Maybe we can revisit that scenario. But I can see the capital needs. In particular, I'm going to mention Orchard Beach, Pelham Bay Park, the largest park in New York City. We know there is a big capital project that has been planned. We've identified, we've already put aside some of the money that work has begun, it's been put on hold because of COVID. I can only see that project being uh, fulfilled through a concession where they'll take the responsibility of building out the concession as needed, taking advantage of the parking and using that park year round. Uh, there are very few places that we can have parking for thousands of cars uh, that is underutilized. And Orchard Beach would be one of those examples. Yep. Please explore this. Uh, that is, yeah, council member, that is already uh, being contemplated um, as the building is being designed and transformed. There are opportunities, but to go with a concession, it's certainly there's a process, but I hear you, you're correct. The location, the parking does lend itself, but we do have to go with a series of steps before we go ahead and initiate uh, that out for a concession. I want to thank you, and uh, I'll continue to hit on that one question, Commissioner. Have we finished identifying all of the city-owned properties and who's responsible for what property? I bring this up again. Ellen Parkway, the median, DOT, sanitation, parks department. No one takes responsibility, and every year, several times a year, it becomes an issue. And I know that there are so many other properties throughout the city uh, that no one claims responsibility for, and it always becomes a shouting match over who's going to maintain and clean up. Can we start working on identifying those properties and which agency will be better equipped to maintain them, whether it be grass cutting or litter removal? But let's at least identify which agency is going to be held responsible. Council member, thank you for that. I remember quite well. It was March 13th, Friday 13th. I was the last budget hearing person to present before COVID hit. And so the answer is, uh, even during that very challenging time, we did initiate those conversations. Your beloved commissioner, uh, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, uh, we started reaching out to DOT to resolve that. I'll get you an update on how that unfolded, but I do remember your articulate and passionate plea to resolve this problem. That was literally the last day of all hearings, and then we moved into COVID and the shelter in place. But I will get you that response, Council Member. Well, thank you, Commissioner. It's my understanding that it was discussed and it, uh, the responsibilities on DOT. And I just don't think DOT is aware of that responsibility because it hasn't been cut since last year. So we're back to six foot high grass, an eyesore, and a potential hazard to motorists and pedestrians. Well, I will follow up. I will follow up and get back to you because you're correct. You, you made your plea loud and clear. We did follow up with DOT. I'll just find out what was that resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Juno. I will now hear from Council Member Adams, followed by Council Members Holden and Council Member Cohen. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, it's always good to see you uh, in any forum. So uh, glad to see you today. 
Um, I also have to give a shout out uh, to my commissioner, Michael Dockett, uh, who has been extraordinary uh, for us in Southeast Queens. Uh, we recently opened the new Gateway Park, which we've been waiting for, as uh, all of our DPR friends know, for a very long time. So we got that done. Uh, really happy to get that done. Uh, also, uh, within my district in Southeast Queens, we've also finished Norelli Park, uh, some more work on the Baisley Park extension. Uh, and as I said, uh, Commissioner Dockett did a walkthrough uh, with our team last week through uh, several uh, Rochdale parks, which we're still working on. So I thank him uh, for all of his work in Southeast Queens and continuing to be a great partner with us. Um, that said, I just have to back up a little bit and deal a little bit more with the equity issue, because it seems as my colleague, Councilmember Joni just says, it almost seems like we're playing catch up. Um, with a lot of things that should have been done, now we're playing catch up with them, you know, during, during, pan, during the pandemic. It's already been established that uh, there's been an equity issue in New York City in the park system, uh, not the least being that larger parks are located in primarily white areas and smaller parks are located in uh, communities of color. Um, this spring uh, in Southeast Queens, we were uh, part of one of the highest hit communities for COVID-19. Uh, and we paid a very large price, both in people that we lost and in our park spaces that had to be closed because of the pandemic. Uh, again, we're playing um, catch up, uh, you know, once again, um, and in dealing with all of this coming together. So just to back up a little bit, Commissioner, I remember when, when I was chairperson of Community Board 12, and you came before us um, with these great projects that are now, um, you know, coming to fruition, um, Community Parks Initiative and uh, Anchor Parks, Parks Without Borders. I remember mentioning back then, I believe around 2014-ish or so, 15-ish or so, mentioning that there was really no uh, representation for Southeast Queens um, at all in, in any of those um, initiatives. Uh, no Roy Wilkins, no Baisley Pond Park, no Addis Lake Park, no Phil Rizzuto Park, the largest park in my district uh, in Richmond Hill. So um, I just want to hear from you. Uh, what are your thoughts as far as um, equity in Southeast Queens when it comes to park equity, when it comes to new initiatives? You know, I mentioned we've got some of the capital stuff. We're shaking those trees loose and getting some more completion done. But what else do you see on the horizon for Southeast Queens as far as expanding you know, our ideas for parks and, and beautification efforts and things like that. Well, well, thank you for your question. And uh, I'm very pleased that we are moving forward and completing some of those parks. The, each one that you mentioned, the Parks Initiative, Anchor Parks and Parks of Borders, each was addressing a specific purpose. The CPI in particular, this was a start under investment. And so we had criteria to determine where the need was most, not to say that it was needed in Southeast Queens, but we're looking at some spaces that hadn't seen investment in decades, in some cases, close to 30 years. So we had to address that first. And I would like to continue this community parks initiative basically eternally because every year you get more parks that see that lack of investment. Same thing with Anchor Parks, we had to pick one per borough, but we're always still focusing capital dollars on other parks. As you know, Brookville Park got some improvements. We're always looking ways of working with the council member, the president and the mayor to make sure we go beyond the community parks initiative, there are other ways to fund these parks. So there are a number of parks that we're focused on. I know our staff needs to be on a regular basis to see how we can put more funds together, but we're focused on equity first, state of good repair, because it's my goal to make sure every park that deserves it gets some level of capital funding. So we'll continue to work with you to see what on that list we can continue to target dollars, because I want every neighborhood, every park to get their fair share and to be improved. But the CPI in particular were just horrible years of lack of investment. And these were the worst of the worst that had been neglected virtually for 20, 30 years. And we wanted to make sure they were addressed first. Now we're looking at the next tranche. I'd like my time back. Thank you, host. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Commissioner. I, I just can't stress enough. You know, again, I think that we're, I feel as though we're playing catch up. And, and I, I misspoke earlier. You said Brookville Park, and you're absolutely right. Um, I, I said Addisley Park, and that, that's another area in Southeast Queens that's on the tip of my mind is being passed here. Roy Wilkins, and I, I, we're doing some investment Roy Wilkins. So we'll get Roy you Wilkins, the, yes. We'll get you the complete list, but I do believe in equity. This is something I've been doing for 20 years. It's not just something I just want to put a check box. I truly believe it. And so uh, we'll sit down, but we are investing a lot in Southeast Queens, but we're looking to do it in all those places that really have been neglected for decades. It awesome. just wasn't fair. And I want to make sure we rectify that. Yeah, thank you very much. And I look forward to working with you and uh, continue, uh, and continue our great work with Commissioner Dockett as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. We'll now hear from Councilmember Holden, followed by Councilmember Cohen. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Ku, for this hearing, and Commissioner Silver for your testimony. And uh, Commissioner, we're still trying to figure out uh, why Parks took a higher percentage budget cut than all uh, the other agencies. But it's kind of like um, that's what happens to Parks and. Uh, and it, and it shows over decades that uh, parks have been neglected, uh, even in good times. Uh, we don't get the budget and, uh, you know, that we deserve uh, for parks. And having been a volunteer in parks for 35 to 40 years almost, um, it, we, we saw what um, we were up against as volunteers. And uh, uh, I just want to ask a few questions. Um, on Because uh, where we left off at a hearing pre-COVID, uh, the street uh, tree planting program because my district and many districts around the city took a hit on um, on trees, as you know. Um, is there a, are we planting trees again in, in the city of New York? We are planting trees again. Uh, I don't have the particulars. I'll see if Matt does. Uh, but we struggle with some of our contracts and the price uh, per tree. We weren't satisfied. We felt it was far too high. And so we kept rebidding it until we got a number low uh, that would be acceptable to the parks and for the taxpayers. And so once we were able to do that, uh, we proceeded. But then when COVID hit, a lot of our work came to a halt. We're back to planting trees again. I don't have the specific location. Uh, Matt, if you have additional information, I, I would certainly welcome it. Yeah, I'm not seeing the, the, the uh, markings on the curb that I used to see when it, before a tree would be planted. And I haven't seen the crews around and, you know, we're concerned because we lost so many. So if you could, um, by the way, how much did, uh, are they each tree costing us now? You mentioned at 1.1500, uh, it was costing. I don't know the number. I know it went as high as 4,000. We felt too high. We had a number down. I don't have that number before me. I, I, I do apologize. I will get that for you, Council Member Holden. Okay. Uh, a question of um, how is how is Parks working with the DOT to identify uh, needed open space in neighborhoods that are relying on small parks? Uh, that is part of our uh, Parks Without Borders initiative, as well as DOT Plaza program. We just look for those opportunities. We find a park, uh, Seward Park is one example uh, in the Lower East Side, uh, Montefiore Square Plaza, another one in Northern Manhattan, uh, Traverse Park in Queens. So where we see an opportunity where they can either demap or temporarily lose a, use a street to extend it. And then we work closely with them on an open streets, play street program over the summer where we identified a lot of miles of street, both in parks, adjacent to parks. And so we do work very closely on a regular basis, always seeking opportunities where we can extend the park experience by either using a street temporarily or whether they're gonna demap as a case of Travers Park to extend that park experience. That's consistent with our Parks Without Borders program to create a more seamless realm. DOT is a great partner. Yeah, uh, so are you coordinating with DOE, Department of Education, on potential schoolyards to playground locations? Yes. Uh, uh, and, yes, the answer is yes. That's part of our schoolyards to playgrounds program. Um, I see Carter Strickland here, he knows it quite well. Uh, but we've been doing that for a number of years. I'll defer over to Deputy Commissioner to tell you how that is working. But we do have that active relationship with DOE. Yes, thank you. Um, we have about uh, 260 schoolyards to playgrounds. Um, right now we're working on about 22 new ones. Um, it's a, as, as I'm sure you're familiar, but just for the record and for the rest of the council members, 
This is a partnership with DOE where DOE staffing provides the extra time after school and holidays and weekends so that the public can access that space. Um, our participation in the schoolyards to playgrounds, aside from the policy side, is often to help provide the capital funding to improve those schoolyards. And we work closely with the principal and um, central DOE to uh, identify those sites. Now, some of the locations, uh, at least the uh, one in my district was stalled because of, you know, we couldn't get the money to pay the custodian to lock up the gates and, or to stay extra time uh, at the school. Is, has that been resolved? I can't speak to the specific playground and I, I'm, I'm sure we could follow up with you. Uh, well, council member on the, I said it was many locations. Yes, uh, I was just city. about to, to say that. It is, it is an issue that, that the original allocation that Department of Education got for schoolyards to playgrounds has been maxed out and to expand the program further, they would need additional expense money to, to pay those custodians uh, to, for the upkeep of those spaces. All right, uh, just one last question, Commissioner. We understand that many nonprofits and community groups are leading uh, service projects to help clean parks. Um, what challenges has the agency faced in helping to support these volunteer groups and what resources are necessary to better support park stewardship groups? Uh, because um, I, we're gonna have to rely more on the- I'm volunteers. inspired. We're really not having any challenges and I wanna personally say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our partners and community members for stepping up. I've gone to a few myself. And it really warms my heart that New Yorkers care that much. They'll take time out of their weekends to go out and help clean our parks. So we're not experiencing any challenges. We've launched it with our campaign. We're gonna to continue to do so. We're gonna double down coming to the spring. But I personally wanna thank those New Yorkers for coming out. It has been a huge boost. Also to our staff around because they're all very prideful about how they keep their parks clean. And to see how some of them look after a weekend during the height of summer was demoralizing. So for volunteers to come out and say, we'll help you, we got your back, was heartening. So we're not having any challenges. We have the resources through partnership for parks and our park staff. And so thank you for the offer and thank all of you council members who also participate in some of those cleanups. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you, Commissioner, for your help and, and support. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair Koo. Thank you, Council Member Holden. Council Member Cohen. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Ku. It's uh, very good to see you, Commissioner. Uh, I think I want to echo uh, some of the comments made by my colleagues. I, I do think uh, if we had medals to give out, I, I think that the Parks Department really did an amazing job this summer under extremely difficult circumstances. Uh, and you and your team and everybody, everybody who keeps these parks clean, it was a monumental effort. Uh, I don't know if you actually provide, I know we talked about uh, that you have data on uh, pools and beaches. I don't know if you said what the increase was, but I mean, I could just tell with my with my own eyes that uh, the uses at, use of beaches and pools was, uh, you know, a multiple of what it normally is. Uh, and uh, you did uh, do amazing work get, getting uh, keeping everything clean. And you know, my office would receive complaints. I, I, I really, you know, people call on Monday morning. I'm like, I know it's Monday morning, but by Monday afternoon, things are going to be okay. Uh, but people really enjoyed complaining about Monday morning. Um, uh, I will also uh, uh, say thank you that uh, you and I, you came up to the district recently and we got to uh, review uh, a number of capital projects that have come to uh, completion, uh, you know, that, that I funded in, in, during my time in the council. And uh, uh, some of these were hard fought, but I am so grateful and they look amazing. You know, Van Cortland Park is really a uh, uh, I, I am, you know, I consider some of that stuff real legacy stuff that it looks amazing and that I know that people are going to enjoy it for many, many years. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, I am a little concerned about it in terms of the, the subject matter that we're dealing with. Um, I don't want to demonize conservancies or groups that raise money for parks. I think it's vitally important that they do that. Uh, I've been trying to encourage uh, the creation of friends of groups. Uh, you know, I've been a tremendous supporter in, in Van Cortland Park of trying to uh, get that group up to the point where they could have a license agreement. I think that would be uh, an important next step. Uh, and then taking greater responsibility uh, for Van Cortland Park. Uh, and I think we have a very good team there at, at the Alliance now. Uh, and lastly, I'm concerned about concessions uh, perpetually being a problem in terms of equity 
uh, that we're giving groups that have license agreements a portion of concession fees uh, when uh, those are our, our wealthier parks. <laughs> it's kind of ironic that if you have a poor park and you have a concession, you're not going to get that money uh, put back into the park. But a wealthier park is getting that money. So that's, I, I don't know what the the logic is of that. I don't know if that policy makes sense to you. If you think it does, if you can tell me why, I'd appreciate it. Well, first, let me say that uh, a lot of our park partners, even the, the conservancies, are struggling too. Uh, many of them had to take out PPP loans. Uh, they knew revenue was down, special event revenue was down. And uh, I'll defer to Deputy Commissioner because she oversees the concession division, but it's a balancing act. Our contribution to those parks, which now uh, little uh, public dollars go into, they raise it. And so each one, the agreement varies. So I can't say there's one approach, but it's a balance and a formula uh, of how a portion of the concession fee uh, in exchange for basically managing an entire park. I mean, that's, eight, that's basically over 800 acres and the amounts, the base amount of what the city puts in is quite minimal. And so we look at a scale of how do we help support uh, these individuals taking care of our park on our behalf. But as I speak to all of our park partners, they all struggled. I know Heather Lupov, and I know Ann Wilson, others really focus a lot uh, on how to help some of those conservancies and were successful in getting funds and PPPs to keep them going. But they're all struggling from modified schedules uh, to furloughs. It is tough out there for our partners. So we wanna make sure all of our parks look good. Those that managed by our partners and conservancies and those by New York City Parks. But I welcome the conversation, Deputy Commissioner. Is there anything you wanna add? But there's no one approach, one size fits all with our concessions. That's right, there is uh, no one size fits all. As uh, the commissioner mentioned, where there is a concession revenue share, those are instances where we hold um, an overall agreement with that conservancy. So there, it's really a limited number where that's set up that way, where there is some revenue share on the concessions. And um, I can attest that uh, both here at Parks and at OMB, I am a law department that those, um, those agreements are based on the concept that the conservancy is bringing something to the table that the city resources aren't otherwise providing. So to your point, council member, the concept is that we shouldn't be uh, taking public resources um, and, and um, uh, to, to support those conservancies, but instead that the conservancy is bringing something to the table and that that revenue from the concessions is helping to support what they're bringing uh, to help maintain and, and care for those parks. Time expired. I know, I know my time has expired. I was one at some point, I, I'm going to reach out. I'd like to schedule a call just so maybe I could get an update on the, uh, I, I think in Van Cortland Park, there's at least two concessions. And I just, I would like to know the status of this. I think the stable was done relatively recently. I'm not as clear on the golf course, uh, but I'll reach out. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Good to see you. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Cohen. At this time, we'll return to Council Member uh, Chair Koo to ask his remaining questions. Hello? I can hear you, Chair Koo. Okay, good. So, uh, Commissioner, thank you for your patience. Yeah. What is the status of the playgrounds that were due to be built? or renovated under the expansion of the schoolyards to playgrounds, to schoolyards to playgrounds initiative that were announced in 2017. Has the administration considered expanding the program at some point in the future? Uh, I'll defer to Deputy Commissioner. I do not believe the program is suspended. We still have the money in our budget, but I don't know the specifics about the ones you mentioned. From 2017. Uh, thanks, Council Member. I also would need to go and find the list of which ones were announced in 2017. Uh, the program is still ongoing. Perhaps um, you're referencing to the pause that some construction and design pro projects had during COVID. And as the Commissioner mentioned, um, we're happy to answer questions on any particular one, although we would need to follow up on, on that uh, specific project. Um, I, perhaps when you were offline, we talked a little bit about the schoolyards, the playgrounds program. The, uh, the sites that we announced we're still moving forward with. Um, expansion of the program beyond um, the, the sites that are already in the public 
um, would require additional expense funding for the Department of Education to pay for um, the folks who help maintain those sites after school hours. Thank you. Uh, according to the Center for Urban Futures report on past infrastructure, DPR had a staff of over 11,642 in the 1970s at the height of the fiscal crisis. Uh, what is the current full and part-time maintenance workforce now? Uh, that number, uh, I would have to get back to you. We fluctuate around 7,000, uh, but I'd have to exactly see what happened with some of our seasonal reductions. But we're roughly between six and 7,000. But I will make sure staff gets back to you with what that exact number is. Now, it does not include uh, our POP workers, uh, but I will get you the number so you can see how we can yeah. compare what was in the 70s versus what is today. So the reason I raised that question is because in the fiscal crisis in the 70s, we have 11,000 workers. 30 years later, or how many years later? <laughs> Seven, two, 50 years later, uh, we have 7,000 workers. So we have like, a loss of 4,000 people. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I think, yeah. so okay. So council member Kuja, so, uh, so that, so that, that I raised the question to tell the administration the the staff is not enough. You know, we have less staff than 50 years ago. And let me just be clear because we have a seasonal workforce. We stay around mm -hmm. six or 7,000 throughout the year. And then we add on seasonals over the summer that bring us close to 10,000. We look at our lifeguards, all the seasonals. In this case, uh, it's well known now that it was 1,700 for this summer season, but we add more people and then they go away. So around March, we start hiring our seasonals so we can handle the peak season. And then se September and October, we start the season ends and then we go back to about six or 7,000. So we have gone as high as 10,000 when we bring in all the seasonals, but again, it fluctuates throughout the year. So I don't know when you say 11,000 back in the 1970s, was that just the non-peak or the peak seasonal number of staff? But of course I would never say no to more staff, but at the same time I know that we're in a severe budget crisis. So I think it's well known that uh, I would not mind having more staff at the same time. We have to all help contribute to the severe budget cuts uh, that's going on right now. I'm going to stop because we have a lot of public participations. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to the moderator, uh, Chris. Thank Hello? you, Commissioner Silver, and everyone else from the Parks Department. Um, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once a sergeant has started the timer. Um, for panelists, once your name is called, the member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Uh, so please wait for the sergeant to announce announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. We will begin with Lindsay Campbell of the USDA Forest Service, followed by Adam Ganser of New Yorkers for Parks, followed by Lynn Kelly of the New York Restoration Project. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on this important topic. I'm a research social scientist with the USDA Forest Service. And our team at the New York City Urban Field Station works in close collaboration with New York City Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy. And we've spent 18 years researching the use, value, and meaning and stewardship of green space. So my testimony draws entirely on peer reviewed research. It's well documented in the literature that public open space is critical resource to support public health and well being, including physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual well being. 
And our research here in New York has found that for many New Yorkers, their neighborhood park is their only outdoor resource. And we know that during COVID-19, this trend toward increased and localized park use has continued. We also know from patterns of economic decline across the country that it doesn't take much for these crucial green space resources to decline in maintenance, be less welcoming, or to become unsafe. And this was experienced firsthand during the 1970s fiscal crisis that led to budget cuts and disinvestment in parkland, out of which emerged the public-private partnership model of the Central Park Conservancy and later dozens of conservancies citywide. Community organizations play a pivotal but often unseen role in supporting public open space and activating them as social infrastructure, leveraging significant person power, time, and resources. Over 800 community organizations, including both formal NGOs and Friends of groups, responded to our StuMap survey in 2017, representing an estimated 540,000 members and staff and with budgets totaling over $800 million. Now, during times of disturbance, these stewardship groups can act as green responders. After a crisis, we all know that first responders help to stabilize life and property, but as part of longer term recovery and preparedness cycles, stewards can also help to rebuild communities and landscapes through environmental action. This pattern has been repeated in New York City with stewardship groups forming and adapting their work in response to the fiscal crisis, September 11th, Hurricane Sandy, and now COVID-19. Civic engagement is crucial to public space. In addition to providing labor and increasing capacity, it strengthens democracy by fostering social trust. So our current COVID-19 research on environmental stewardship highlights that along with the increase in park use, we've seen a decrease in staffing and funding levels of civic stewardship groups. They're working with limited capacity to care for green spaces that are vitally needed. So we have an over-reliance, but an under-resourcing of civic stewardship groups in frontline communities. So in sum, while it's important to focus on the care for the physical resource of parks and open space, it's not enough. We need to support the people and organizations that care for these green spaces. so They can truly function as equitable and inclusive. I'm inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. We will now hear from Adam Ganser of New Yorkers for Parks. Time begins now. The Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. We are New York City's only independent parks and open space advocacy and research organization, and we co-founded the Playfair Coalition. I appreciate being able to talk today. As we've heard, this administration has prioritized parks equity with many lasting accomplishments. The COVID crisis, however, has revealed st significant structural inequities in our park system, both in access and in funding that require a new emphasis, both in the immediate and the long term. Our park system relies on hundreds of small parks to provide open space to the majority of New Yorkers. As a result, parks that serve the majority of low income households are less than half as big as the parks that are serving high income households. And these parks are wholly reliant on public funding. These smaller parks have been more susceptible to closures during the pandemic with catastrophic results. According to data from the Trust for Public Land, more than 1 million New Yorkers in central Brooklyn, Queens, and the East Bronx lost access to their park or playground this year. The COVID related economic crisis also had an uh, inequitable impact on New Yorkers and their parks. Despite record use during the pandemic, the parks department budget was cut by 14%, that's second highest among all agencies. Those cuts have had drastic reductions in staff and maintenance. And not surprisingly, the areas most impacted by the closures and the staff reductions are the same areas where the largest numbers of New Yorkers have died or become seriously ill from COVID. Also not surprisingly, unfortunately, these are primarily communities of color. As we look to an increase in COVID this fall, unfortunately, the city must aggressively plan to ensure all New Yorkers have access to open space. Some immediate priorities include getting funding to ensure full, full seasonal park staff, unfreezing capital funds for critical parks improvement projects, and eliminating the onerous legal requirements that make it nearly impossible for many private not-for-profit partners of the parks organization to do their jobs, uh, raise money and take care of our spaces. Um, further, we do not lose, want, want to lose sight of the opportunity to adopt system change ideas that address historic challenges for our park system. Uh, 
First, we need to identify a more resilient and equitable funding, public funding model for our park system. And second, we need to prioritize creative new park development in the outer boroughs as part of an equitable economic recovery. For both, I would respectfully point the council to a report New Yorkers for Park, Parks co-authored with the New York Building Congress and an op-ed I wrote with Carter Strickland from the Trust for Public Land. This is a critical moment for our park system with significant opportunities to make lasting change for a better New York. I thank you for your time. Thank you. And at this point, I'd just like to remind council members who may have a question for any particular panelist to please use the Zoom raise hand function uh, while that panelist is speaking and you, you'll be able to ask their, your questions uh, once they are done. Uh, the next panelist is Lynn Kelly of the New York Restoration Project, followed by Joe Puleo of DC 37 and Marlena Giga of DC 37. Time starts now. Good afternoon, City Council members. Great to see you and my colleagues uh, in the parks world and at the Parks Department. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. So I'll start by stating the obvious. Uh, COVID has turned our beloved city upside down and we're still reeling from the impacts, physical, mental, and financial. Recovery has not been easy. It's not been swift. And as you all know, there's conflicting information almost daily. But the one thing that has remained constant is that we New Yorkers have flocked to our parks and open spaces in record numbers. And we need those green spaces now more than ever. That's why it was shocking to all of us in the open space community that the city's drastic cuts to the funding for the New York City Parks Department in fiscal year 21 uh, occurred while at the same time the administration was pointing to parks and open space as a part of the recovery, recovery of New York City. To me, that makes no sense and is antithetical to parks equity. Uh, many of these cuts will directly impact access, maintenance uh, in our green spaces, especially in low, in community, low income communities, as you've heard, the same communities which were hit hard, hardest by COVID. And so I want to ask this council and the administration, how is that equitable? Just how is that fair? Um, New York Restoration Project, like many of our colleagues here today, we rely on parks equity initiative funds to steward gardens, to build new open spaces in some of the least green neighborhoods in New York. We work in communities that don't have the support of resource conservancies, volunteer stewardship groups, or publicly funded programs. So cuts to PEI in a greater New York City hit doubly hard. Additionally, it makes no sense to us whatsoever that currently the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, has paused approximately $50 million in funding for capital projects to qualified and experienced park nonprofits, like many of the folks you see on this call, who could be delivering critical services during the pandemic and its wake. How is that equitable? How is that fair? How does that even make sense? Listen, we know the city is broke, uh, but the projects on pause by OMB were funded to respond to long-standing need. And the steep increase in open space usage during COVID has only underscored the importance of executing on these projects. To be clear, delaying them means delaying our ability to properly address food insecurity, access to open and green space, critical maintenance, all items which speak directly to parks equity in our city. And so we ask that the council and the administration please work with us to get these critical projects unstuck at OMB so that we can truly be a part of New York City's COVID-19 recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Joe Paleo of DC 37 followed by Marlena Giga of DC 37. Time starts now. <laughs> Thank you, City Council. Thank you, Chairman Koo. Uh, my name is Joe Puglio. I represent uh, Local 983. Uh, we represent the Urban Park Rangers, the PEP officers. We represent the uh, Associate Park Service workers, the city's seasonal aides throughout the uh, parks. We were hit exceptionally hard this year, especially with our CSAs. Uh, we lost 50 Rangers. We lost 100. 30 lines that we previously had during the summer budget. And the parks are probably in worse shape than they've ever been. Garbage is being piled up high. Uh, we need these workers back. We are also facing additional layoffs. You know, we're facing 22,000 citywide layoffs, 
which uh, would, which would include uh, these park workers as well. Uh, parks, parks should be prioritized. This is the only green space most people have in the city of New York. And you know, we talk about people of color, you know, being deprived. You know, it's only going to get worse. We have to find funding for our parks. This is unsustainable. We cannot continue. I uh, realize the difficulties that the parks department has, you know, in trying to uh, do more with less, but it comes to a point where you just cannot make it happen anymore. We need to have funding restored and we need to do it now. You know, th things are only going to go downhill. Uh, we can talk about this, you know, day and night, but the only solution is funding, unfortunately. Um, I won't take up more space, but when, uh, more time, I should say, but when you reduce it by $85 million and we already face 1,700 layoffs and there's probably more to come, we're going to hit, you know, rock bottom and we're going to hit it soon. And it's going to be a detriment to everyone in the city of New York. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Marlena Giga, followed by Daniel Clay of DC 37. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marlena Giga. I'm one of the union reps for Local 983. We represent a number of titles. Um, right now, our, pe our PEP and Rangers are spread very thin, and currently the crime is up in parks tremendously. PEP is the primary entity in parks that does the enforcement, not the NYPD. Uh, PEP and Rangers, they continue to patrol, but they have limited vehicles. Uh, and many times over the summer and just recently, our offices have not been able to respond to emergencies due to lack of vehicles. We ask that you please restore the funding for the PEP and the Rangers, along with the maintenance people, the maintenance people at times, they're being rushed from one location to another. And they have limited staff. We have lots of complaints that the garbage is piling up at several locations. So please restore the funding so our parks can uh, go back to looking beautiful again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Daniel Clay of DC 37, and he will be followed by Carter Strickland of the Trust for Public Land. Time starts now. Hi there, everybody. Thank you, Chairman Ku and, and all the council members and, and everybody that helped organize this and, and everybody else voicing your support too. This is really something special. Um, I'm Daniel Clay. I'm a gardener in Prospect Park and uh, president of our little local. Um, I'm, I'm, but I'm one of the, the few pairs of boots on the ground, and uh, I could tell you it, it's 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 uh, busy out there. Um, the stress to the parks is is growing, and uh, the the other thing about that is it's going to get worse um, in the next few years too. I'll tell you about that. It's it's um, in the form of invasive plants and insects that are headed our way. Um, Guys, if you get the heebie-jeebies, do not Google videos of the spotted lanternfly, which is headed our, headed our way. And there's there's other ones too. I could, I could giant hogweed is another bad plant we don't want around here. Um, we green workers, um, you know, are, are the last line of defense against these kinds of things. Um, uh, and not to mention the storms, which are getting worse too. Okay. Um, so with the parks just being busier, yeah, we green workers are just doing a lot more cleaning, which is tough on, on what we, you know, uh, what we should be doing. And um, the thing, uh, I, I just want to remind everybody is that all of us in working in the parks, we, we, we're here for you and your children's safety. And um, I really hope we can maintain especially because there's so many new young parkies with, with such passion that there is really such great passion. Thanks everybody. That's, uh, that's all the time that I need. Thank you. At this, at this point, we have questions from council member Holden followed by council member Cohen and council members. If you could uh, announce who you are directing your question to when you ask your question, that would be great. Thank you. 
Time starts now. Yes, uh, thank you. I just have a, for, it could be for um, either a DC 37, Joe or, or Daniel or, or anybody. Um, did the administration uh, ever reach out to you guys talk about the budget? Like uh, rather than, were there any creative um, methods used that they approached you with to try to save as many seasonals as they could? Or was it just um, they were dictating to you guys or, and then this is how it's going to be. Um, because um, back, you know, in 1976, I was working for CUNY and we went through a similar budget cut and they offered the unions um, a furlough. That means we didn't get paid for two weeks out of the, you know, particular month, let's say, or it might've been out a few months. And then we, they held on to the money. We got it with interest a few years later but they were able to avoid layoffs. Was that ever offered, anything offered to, to the unions um, during the- Yeah, uh, 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 no, none was offered. Uh, we just got the notices of the layoffs and that was it. Uh, there were no types of concessions brought to us. All right, that's good to know. Uh, thanks, Joe, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cohen. Time starts now. Th thank you. I, I think DC 37 is in the best position to answer for me, my question too. Um, uh, Chair Ku and I wrote a letter to the administration uh, pre-adoption uh, trying to talk about maybe uh, re-envisioning the mission of PEP. Um, I watched you know, PEP this summer you know, in a, in a single person patrol, which is not a, not a safe or an effective way uh, to do the work, uh, but trying to uh, in, envision a, a role for parks, you know, try, that reduce our reliance on NYPD in parks uh, and increase the role of PEP. Um, has there been any discussion with the administration about uh, sort of re-envisioning PEP and how that could work? No, no, absolutely none. And we're open to discussions on that. As you said, it is a dangerous job and it becomes even more dangerous when you do solo patrol. We're all for, um, you know, hearing from all of you, you know, with, with new ideas. And I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to think outside the box because uh, we're in a pandemic, we're in unprecedented times and we can't function like we normally function, you know? So there are um, struggles to, go, uh, to contend with you know, there are resource issues, but I'm sure the solutions there too in the process if we if we uh, try to work these things out. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of knee jerk reactions. You know, we did not have any uh, in-depth solutions, um, you know, on how these things could be um, worked out. That's real. That's really unfortunate. Uh, I do think that there is a, a you know, a, a new role for PEP in our parks. Uh, in in the current environment we in that that will be that could keep us safer and keep our parks uh, you know better managed uh, and reduce our reliance on NYPD. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Carter Strickland of the Trust for Public Land, followed by Emily Maxwell of the Nature Conservancy. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, and thank you, everyone, Chair. Person Ku and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on this really critical issue of equity in parks. My name is Carter Strickland. I'm the New York State Director of the Trust for Public Land, a national nonprofit organization that creates parks and protects lands. We've worked with many of you and with the city on our signature green schoolyards program, uh, a public-private partnership uh, that works with community members, local and state elected officials, uh, New York City schools, and others to transform uh, barren lots at schools into open community spaces, and I think that's critical. I do at the outset want to commend Commissioner Silver and his team for putting equity at the forefront of parks construction operations and planning really for the get-go, and uh, they've done a lot, and as I'll testify, there's, there's a lot left to do, um, and it really requires resources. As uh, several people have mentioned, a national indicator that the Trust for Public Land uses to assess park equity is uh, the number of residents within a 10 minute walk of a park. It's not the same metric as Deputy Commissioner Conan put it, pointed out as uh, New York City uses, it holds itself to a higher standard, which isn't great, incredible. On our metric, which is slightly more forgiving, New York City has incredible numbers. 99% um, of its residents live near a park. 
in a normal year. And I think that's critical because the normally high park access index in New York City, um, we know now is highly vulnerable to disruption, just as Hurricane Sandy revealed the vulnerabilities of transportation, electrical and other infrastructure. COVID-19 has revealed the vulnerabilities in our park infrastructure. Uh, and I use that term advisedly because I think parks really uh, should be treated as infrastructure. In that vein, we need to make our park system more resilient by building more parks with overlapping service areas, as we would do with other infrastructure systems in order to ensure continuity of operations. It's critical in New York City, and I will say that Con Ed uh, has a resiliency plus two metric it uses, unlike every other utility in the whole country. So we do hold ourselves to a higher standard. Um, COVID-19 uh, did force the closure of uh, a lot of schoolyards and playgrounds from April 1 to June 23rd of this year. And again, by our analysis and uh, my written testimony um, provides the link for that, we uh, assessed that one, uh, over 1 million New Yorkers lost park access during this critical period. Um, Second, park size is not equitably distributed. Um, it is uh, smallest in low-income and minority neighborhoods. Again, uh, we have some links to that analysis. And so what does that mean? Um, that means to improve park equity, uh, we can start by acknowledging the legacy park system's not enough. We need to build new parks. We can do that in green schoolyards. Every community has a schoolyard and we can do it with open streets because every community has streets. Uh, within that, my time is up and I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And I believe council member Holden does have a question. Time starts now. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Carter, for, the, for your, uh, your testimony, but, but more importantly, your tremendous work uh, throughout uh, my, my district and in, in districts throughout the city of New York. Um, very creative uh, layouts um, and in my, my district. Uh, we love the designs. Um, and um, the, the kids are really having a great time with, with that park. And I, I just hope you, uh, the COVID didn't, um, doesn't curtail the construction projects. Have they, has, have the uh, projects been delayed that you're working on? I just want to make sure I'm unmuted. Uh, they have been delayed. We've picked them up slowly. We've been working. SCA is a great partner. They, like other agencies, have been held up by OMB um, uh, due to the city's fiscal crisis. Um, we are starting to get projects unlocked uh, over time. So uh, it, it is happening slowly. It's not universal. And I don't think that's, I think that's uh, the same case for capital projects um, across the city. Um, so uh, we haven't had all our projects that are pending released, um, but they're starting to be released. Okay, if you, have, if you, you can let the council know if there's uh, projects that are extremely important uh, uh, in underserved areas, please let us know that maybe we can uh, advance that, help advance it. Thank you. Thank you. I, Thank you. Uh, happy to do that, uh, Council Member Holden. And I do want to say also, uh, as De uh, Deputy Commissioner Conan uh, remarked, operational funding through custodials is not resolved and uh, does need to be resolved as well to keep School of Heroes and other school uh, playgrounds open. Thanks so much for that one. I, that's good to know. Thank you. Next, we will move on to Emily Maxwell of the Nature Conservancy, followed by Sarah Charlotte Powers of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Noble Maxwell, and I'm the director of the Nature Conservancy City Program in New York. I have more to share than I can share in three minutes, so I'm going to forego a long introduction about us, but suffice it to say, we work to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends um, globally. The title of this hearing itself, Improving the Equity of Green Space Throughout the City in Light of the COVID Epidemic, marks a tremendous step forward. I want to commend and to thank um, Chairman Ku and this committee for considering this broad and forward-looking approach. Green space and the potential for more of it exist both within and beyond the boundaries of New York City parkland, and it's wise to approach it as such. Green space is crucial for the health and safety of New Yorkers and for the livability and economic recovery of New York City. The COVID-19 pandemic has put a spotlight on crucial societal issues that compel us to think about green space equity. 
Simply put, our lives depend on nature and city residents who have access to more nature and green space in their neighborhood will suffer less in our climate changing world. But before talking about the broad diversity of green spaces in New York City and opportunities to increase equity, and um, I must underscore that we, were, we are starting off with inequitable resources for parks and green spaces. Despite the laudable efforts of this committee and hundreds of advocacy groups across the city, New York City Parks and Rec is chronically underfunded as many of my colleagues have underscored. The extreme cuts DPR experienced under the COVID-19 constrained budget are shocking considering both the crucial role parks play in providing safe and healthy respites and the tiny percentage of the New York City budget for which DPR's budget already accounts. Disinvesting from parks makes no sense right now in the short term or the long term, given the role they play in New York City's recovery from safe recreational spaces to economic engines. Recent research led by the New School with us as a partner underscores the need for parks and open spaces. There is overwhelming and consistent public recognition for the many benefits of parks and specifically for the benefits to health, physical and mental. The majority of our respondents said that while they might have some access to a park and open space, they don't necessarily feel at ease in those parks or that those parks are meeting their needs. We're particularly concerned about Queens and Brooklyn where we saw a lot of that data and those are neighborhoods particularly hard hit by COVID. Um, our urban forest is also a crucial asset and I'll just note, because we have a lot to say about this, that we know that it's inequitably distributed from 18% cover in Brooklyn to 31% in Staten Island. Some of our city council districts have a low as, as 10%, some have up to over 40. We need to take a hard look at that. Um, I see that my time is coming to a close. So I also have to note that our rooftops, NYCHA properties, community gardens, and stewardship groups must also be strongly considered, and that all of these assets will be crucial to New York City's recovery. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Sarah Charlotte Powers of the Natural Areas Conservancy, and she will be followed by um, Carlos Castel Croak of the um, uh, New York League of Conservation Voters. Time starts now. Great. Well, um, thank you so much to Council Member Ku and the members of the Parks Committee. Like others, I've done a little bit of real time editing so I can hit some key points. Um, I'd like to introduce the Natural Areas Conservancy. We are a nonprofit organization and we work as a partner to the Parks Department to restore and manage the 10,000 acres of forests and wetlands that are under the agency, agency's jurisdiction. Um, I wish to highlight that the FY21 budget, which included 14% cut to the parks budget, was passed during a period of unprecedented visitation to parks. And I wish to specifically highlight the importance of forests and wetlands in providing equitable access to parks and to nature for New Yorkers always, but especially during the pandemic. This summer, our field staff conducted interviews in parks across the five boroughs of visitors to natural areas. 65% of the people we interviewed said that they were spending significantly more time in natural areas than they had prior to COVID-19. In our interviews, people highlighted how important natural areas are because they are uniquely suited to the needs of this moment, offering ample space for social distancing and providing a respite from the stresses of life during both a pandemic and a recession. As we look to the future, investing in the care of one third of our city's park system should be high on the list of priorities for addressing issues of both equity and access. Investing in consistent access to natural areas in the form of clearly marked trails would allow New Yorkers to more effectively access thousands of acres of existing parkland that are currently poorly accessible across every borough. And investing in the care of forests and wetlands would also provide countless other benefits to our city, including combating extreme heat, capturing carbon and strengthening the connection of New Yorkers to the natural world. To achieve these goals, we would need both new multi-year capital funding as well 
as expense funding to bring back the staff needed to support stewardship, to conduct ranger programming, to maintain trails, to plant trees, and to provide the basic level of care that are to our parks that New Yorkers deserve. Thanks again for your leadership during this challenging time and for the opportunity to testify about this important topic today. Thank you. We'll now hear from Carlos Castell Croak of the New York, Le New York City League of Conservation Voters, followed by Greg Todd. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chair Ku for holding this important hearing and for the opportunity to testify today. The past seven months have been hard on us all. New Yorkers have had to bear immeasurable hardships, including the mental and emotional toll of responsibly practicing social distancing, which for many of us means more time in tiny apartments and yearning for to feel some grass under our toes. Uh, we all look forward to the day when we can safely return to our offices, frequent our local bars and restaurants without worrying about capacity, and embrace our friends and loved ones without masks and without anxiety. But until then, we need our parks and open spaces now more than ever, as they provide a crucial outlet for New Yorkers to take care of their physical, mental, and emotional health. Parks and other green spaces are also one of the city's most valuable environmental assets and are a major source of the city's urban canopy, which mitigates climate change and provides a clean air and habitats for native wildlife. The 2.6 million street and park trees that the Parks Department is responsible for remove 1,300 tons of pollutants from the atmosphere and store 1 million tons of carbon each year. Trees are vital for mitigating urban heat island effect and can lower temperatures by up to 9 degrees, cut air conditioning use by 30% and reduce heating energy use by a further 20 to 50%. NYC's parks contribute to our resiliency by capturing almost 2 billion gallons of stormwater runoff. Unfortunately, funding for parks was gutted in this year's budget. We understand the difficult financial decisions that had to be made due to the city's dire economic situation, but we oppose the cuts to the park, Parks Department because parks are so important at this moment. That's why along with other members of the Playfair for Parks Coalition, we are asking the council to reallocate funds back to the parks budget to ensure that we obtain ample support to keep these spaces safe for public use now. First and foremost, we need our parks employees back. We all agree that parks are critical infrastructure, but these green benefits could not be realized without the parks employees, particularly gardeners, horticultur horticulturalists, maintenance workers who work tire tirelessly to ensure the health of these spaces. Um, secondly, we need to restore funding for critical operations such as repairs, maintenance, pruning, and cleaning, to keep our parks in adequate condition for our residents. And last, we need to improve park access, in particular in low-income neighborhoods and communities burdened by pollution. 70% of New Yorkers still live further than walking distance from a park, meaning that we need more parks and communities that historically lack open spaces and the local environmental benefits of a nearby park. While the COVID-19 crisis has caused the city to cut agency budgets across the board, it has also exposed the desperate need the city has for parks maintenance, improvements, and access. NYLCV, as a founding member of the Playfair Coalition, asked for the council's help to reallocate funds back to the Parks Department budget in this time when it is so desperately needed. Thank you. Time expired. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Greg Todd, followed by Tara Kelly. Time starts now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, Hello. we hear you now. Okay. Um, yeah, I would like to just to direct the attention of the um, council members and the rest of the attendees um, to the valuable uh, contribution made by community gardens. Though a tiny, tiny fraction of the budget, I would surprise if there are 30 people on the Green Thumb staff that supervise community gardens, the predominant number of community gardens are in low and mod neighborhoods. In Brooklyn, that would be principally Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brownsville, East New York. So if your concern is having equity and providing access to gardens in low income neighborhoods, there's an incredible value added by the community gardens. 
Um, these gardens provide something very unique. They're not uh, passive entertainment in the manner that many parks are, but they're actually very actively involved. We have a, the Amani Garden where I'm a facilitator, over 30 members involved in raising vegetables. Uh, we have chickens in the garden. We've got a greenhouse. We even have an educational area in, all in just about 300 square feet. So it's actually an incredible uh, return for the amount of investment. And I would really encourage more funding for the Green Thumbs program. I think it's a really a tremendous way to provide access to folks who don't have access to parks. They will have access to community gardens, but we really need to be uh, considered uh, in the funding. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now hear from Tara Kelly of the Municipal Arts Society, and she will be followed by Kay Webster and Christina Taylor. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. The Municipal Arts Society of New York has been providing input on the city's parks and public realm since our founding in 1893. With this unique historical perspective, we have observed the evolution of how our open spaces have functioned to meet the needs of a growing city and provide the space for recreation, celebration, respite, and connection with nature. We continue to value the role of parks in helping communities reduce stress, maintaining mental and physical wellness, and anchoring livable neighborhoods. Parks makes communities happier, healthier, safer, greener, and more resilient. Investments in parks have been a key strategy for community revitalization and economic development. Despite this relationship, new park space has not always been adequate to meet the need of growing neighborhoods. For example, in the proposed special Blushing Waterfront District, new open space is limited to a new 2,000 square foot plaza. While there would be a new po uh, shore public walkway required as a result of the rezoning, no additional public green space would be provided despite welcoming over 1,700 new residential units and nearly 1.5 million square feet of commercial space. New development has a key role to play in expanding park equity by not only providing the minimum required open space, but further improving conditions for both new and current residents. When we look at existing park infrastructure, playgrounds are indispensable for equitable access. Early in the pandemic, many of these spaces were closed, eliminating vital open space for communities whose closest park is a playground. As part of this network, jointly operated playgrounds are crucial to the provision of quality and accessible parks and open space in the city, particularly in underserved neighborhoods. JOPs have figured prominently in the city's open space policy and have been continuously identified as key infrastructure necessary to accomplish citywide and long-term open space goals. The city needs to protect and enhance these spaces, especially as schools and their surrounding communities continue to struggle with in-person attendance, remote learning, and community use after hours. On the planning and investment side, CPI is the city's most important park equity program. Parks selected under CPI are in low-income, densely populated, and growing neighborhoods. They're, they are the communities that need parks most and in the very same ones most impacted by COVID. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, just to say that New York needs has an opportunity to foster proactive planning, integration, and management of its public realm. Unlike many other cities, New York selects a central position within its government responsible for planning and maintaining the public realm. Instead, the city segments oversight of these essential pieces of infrastructure to different agencies. What we need is a director of the public realm to guide the leadership and to take responsibility for all of the spaces in between buildings where so much of civic life takes place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Kay Webster. Time starts now. Hi, um, my name is Kay Webster. I'm the president of the Sarah Roosevelt Park Community Coalition. And thanks for this chance to speak on park equity and COVID-19 and to all who've spoken on behalf of parks. Our park is a block wide and spans eight blocks from the Lower East Side to Chinatown, the Bowery's one block away. It abuts ELL high schools, mostly students of color from low income backgrounds. It has NYCHA complexes and housing for the deaf, low income tenements. There are several homeless shelters and homeless service providers close by. 
Um, <clears throat> University Settlement, Chinatown Planning Council, Chinatown Y, the Tenement Museum, rely on the park. BRC's Low Income Senior Nutrition Center occupies one of four park houses in the park. Um, our coalition stewards about 11 areas of the park, including the Findacolunga Green Thumb Garden, Audubon, New York, and the Horticultural Society, along with many, many organizations and uh, individuals. Um, we have been active in this park for, park for four decades. For most of those decades, we've worked to create and maintain positive use. In the 70s, uh, park dealers and pimps owned this park until the neighborhood took it back. In the early months of COVID, we had people sleeping in pathways in all areas of the park where it was safer than crowded shelters. Garbage mounted and still does. I've never seen it this bad and that is saying something. Um, the park house bathrooms are not open 24 seven. You can't without supervision, which leaves the homeless population to use flower beds. Uh, the early days of COVID, our coalition went around and posted information for the street homeless and how to prevent its spread, but there was nowhere for them to wash their hands or get any kind of help. The northern end is dangerous and unusable to the public. No parent would bring their child to two of the three playgrounds here, nor do the abutting high schools use it. Drugs are sold, sex acts occur in playgrounds, the spray shower is a bath for the homeless who lost their shower facilities to gentrification, people defecate and urinate in the plots, there's even an actual toilet in one of them. Homeless people are struggling with mental health as both victims and victimizers. We are constantly trying to keep housed neighbors from being pitted against the unhoused. Our intrepid park workers who remain after budget cuts and our volunteer gardeners continue to try to maintain this park and keep it afloat uh, daily. Um, and it still has a, not a small bit of magic and human kindness. We've asked to have the Northern Building return to the neighborhood for decades, anchoring the park with this level of misuse is the only way to do that. The public and the Parks Department are stewards of the park. Parks Department's mission is to care for them, give them, give them the tools they need to do so. They are the last democratic meeting spaces in this city. And in COVID, they've been the only places where a family of four living in a tenement apartment could come here to breathe, meet friends and feel alive. They served as a life raft for the homeless who were trapped in congregate living spaces. I'm expired. Those of us who live here, who work here, who despite the dangers from unstable human beings living on the edge of inhumane conditions, who clean up needles and human feces who plant and tent gardens here, are asking the city to put its money where its mouth is in terms of equity. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. Thank you. Uh, before we continue, Council Member Ku, I believe, does have a question for Greg Todd, if you're available. Yeah, you see available? Uh, Mr. Todd, can you hear us? He might not be able to hear us at this point. He is in <clears throat> frame. Um, Chair, if you're okay with that, we can proceed to the next panel. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Christina Taylor, and followed by Sarah Doherty. Time starts now. We can't hear you, Ms. Taylor. Sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Christina Taylor, the Director of Programs and Operations for the Van Cortland Park Alliance. Thank you for allowing me to testify in support of improving the equity of green space throughout the city. This has been something that's been needed for many years now, but is needed more than ever in the light of the COVID pandemic. This is the time for people to experience okay. nature as a way of maintaining a sense of normalcy and connection to the world. This is the time for the city to support its parks so that everyone, regardless of economic status, cultural background, or ability can enjoy the clean green space that they deserve. But the reality we face is that the city is drastically cutting the funds to New York City parks and the parks are suffering. Bathrooms are going uncleaned or locked entirely. Lawns have gone uncut. Areas where large groups of people gather are unpatrolled. It's not pretty and it will only get worse. New York City Parks does not have enough maintenance, operations, and horticultural staff to keep parks looking good. 
seasonal employment, which is a huge part of the work, parks workforce, was cut by at least 90%. Whatever work we've done so far to improve our parks is falling by the wayside. And while all the parks are seeing the alarming results of the cuts, nowhere is it more felt than in the Bronx, where we already receive a much smaller piece of the pie. Low income Bronx residents do not have country homes to escape to. They do not have backyards, they have parks. Parks are in essential infrastructure in a healthy city and critical spaces in a democracy. The mayor talks about equity and inclusion with no cost of emission and locations throughout the city. Parks are the most equitable and inclusive assets of them all. Ever since the start of the COVID pandemic, Van Cortlandt Park has seen twice the number of people with half of the staff. The Alliance has tried to step up and do our part and support the parks by hiring seasonal staff for the district and hosting weekly cleanup volunteer events, but we still cannot keep up with the demand. The Van Cortlandt Park Alliance fully supports the New York City Department of Parks and Recreations and its efforts to maintain and improve all the parks in the city. And it's important to the future of New York City that we fund our parks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed with Sarah Darty, uh, Mr. Todd, Greg Todd, if you're if you're there, I believe Council Member Ku, the chair, does have a question for you. Council Member. Okay, Koo. I'm back. Thank you, Council Member Ku. You can go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes. Okay. You can hear me? Yes, we hear you, yes. Mr. Tucker. Okay, is there a question? Yeah, we're just checking with Council Member because it might be an, oh. a technical issue. Uh, sit tight for one second, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. yes. please go ahead, Chair Koo. Yeah. Okay. So my 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 question to you is that uh, I heard many community gardens. Uh, they they grow the food and then they give it to the uh, food, local food pantries during the pandemic, uh, especially during the peak pandemic. Uh, so are you guys still doing it, or any other group still doing it? Yeah, we we actually gave away. Uh, every week for two hours at a local church food pantry for about three months. We had to stop because we simply, you know, it's it's fall, our plants are all dead. <laughs> no. We gave away a lot of tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and broccoli and kale and all kinds of stuff for free. Yeah, absolutely. So, so thank you very much for your efforts. Yeah, so that's why I said, Community gardens are very important. It only takes up a little budget from the city, uh, but you give senior citizens uh, 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 time to spend in the garden uh, rather than stay at home watching TV, right? Yeah. So yeah. you guys keep active and produce a lot of food for the community. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll now hear from Sarah, Sarah Darty of the Waterfront Alliance, and she will be followed by Ann Wilson, followed by Heather Lubov. Time starts now. Hi, and thank you, uh, Chairman Ku and the Parks Committee. My name is Sarah Doherty, and I'm Senior Program Manager at the Waterfront Alliance. I wanted to start by echoing the sentiment that the title of this hearing, as well as the progress the Parks Department has made during this administration, are positive forces in the fight for equitable park access. I know a lot of the things I was gonna say um, have already been said. Um, so I'll try to tailor my comments to offer a waterfront access specific perspective. My organization, the Waterfront Alliance is a nonprofit working to revitalize and inspire resilient, revitalized and accessible waterfront communities through our Rise to Resilience campaign and through uh, other programs, including the one that I manage, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines or WEDGE program. Earlier this summer, we released a report with many of the folks uh, on this meeting um, with the task force based on the key finding that waterfront access is improving, but not for every New Yorker. 
the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Estuary Program has done um, a study that's shown that uh, the communities lacking waterfront access in our city are also primarily low income communities of color. And these are also the areas which have been hardest hit by the pandemic as has been stated. Um, but the discrepancy between neighborhoods who have quality waterfront access like Brooklyn Bridge Park and those who don't is just one of the many ways that the pandemic has highlighted the staggering economic and social inequities of our region and beyond. And as has already been said, public health and access to waterfront space are closely linked. There are specifically studies that show that the presence of clean water on site can boost confidence as well as lower blood pressure. And these health benefits shouldn't be limited to whiter, wealthier neighborhoods. Um, additionally, New Yorkers have legal rights to quality waterfronts. Through the Waterfront Alliance's Wedge Pledge campaign with community boards across the city, we raised awareness about the public trust doctrine and the way that that's codified through state uh, and local coastal management um, policy. So the report has a number of recommendations related to equitable access, but I think first and foremost, we echo and support uh, New Yorkers for Parks Play Fair campaign um, and think the city council should implement a permanent baseline budget for park staff, especially during um, the, the pandemic and the increased needs for waterfront access. Secondly, we commend the, the Parks Department for the City Council or for the Community Parks Initiative and hope to see that it's codified. Um, and it's paramount that quality waterfronts are not solely paid for through private development uh, like zoning, which could hasten gentrification, but also through public investment. And finally, uh, as a community engagement zealot myself, um, it's going to look a lot different in the coming months around waterfront land use decisions. And it's already hard for working class and immigrant communities to participate in community, city-led community engagement. So we hope that city council will um, have metrics for what good engagement looks like to make sure that uh, particularly communities that have been hardest hit by the pandemic can participate. Um, and thank you so much. That's all that I have um, for listening. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Ann Wilson of the Randalls Island Park Alliance. Time begins now. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Ann Wilson. I'm the Senior Director of Planning for the Randalls Island Park Alliance. Randalls Island Park is located in the East River between East Harlem, the South Bronx, and Astoria, Queens. As a nonprofit steward, RIPA develops and maintains the park and provides and facilitates extensive public programming. To do so, we work in close partnership with the New York City Parks Department. Due to COVID, like many nonprofits, RIPA's operating budget has taken an enormous hit. We have furloughed staff, cut budgets, and creatively restructured, and it has been a tough year. While in the meantime, the park has seen record-breaking public use, especially coming from neighboring communities in East Harlem and the South Bronx. Our challenge is made more difficult due to the loss of funding for the Parks Department. Normally, during the busy outdoor season, a diverse RIPA staff of 70 works alongside 30 parks workers to maintain the island's 330 acres of public parkland. In 2020, park staff was reduced to only 10, with threats of further cuts. We've also seen a stop on procurements for even the most basic OTPS needs. We have watched our sister parks struggle with such reduced resources alongside greatly increased usage, and it's a losing equation. One key route to greater equity in terms of green space in New York City is to restore funding for its parks, parks department. If anything, COVID has made the case for more support than ever. The pandemic has underscored the absolutely crucial need for our public parks. Over the past six months, New Yorkers have come increasingly to depend upon free, safe, clean outdoor spaces for recreation, relaxation, and exercise. This is especially true for those without the means to leave the city. With sufficient upkeep, public parks can and should provide a safe space where all New Yorkers can take a break and come together in difficult times, an essential resource serving our most basic well-being. New York City Parks Department funding should not only be restored, but in fact expanded during this crisis. It's a pandemic that is sending us all outdoors, and that is especially impacting already under-resourced areas like those adjacent to Randalls Island Park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Heather Lubov of the City Parks Foundation, followed by Owen of the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club. 
Thank you. Um, Time begins now. Thank you. I'm Heather Luba from City Parks Foundation, and we are a nonprofit that leads free sports, arts, and environmental education programs in parks. And we also co-manage Partnerships for Parks, which is a joint program with the Parks Department. Everything we do is meant to encourage New Yorkers to use and care for their neighborhood parks. You've already heard some of the grim budget stats and the maintenance impacts. New York City is relying on a network of community volunteer groups that you also heard Lindsay speak about from StuMap called Green Responders uh, to help with litter removal, planting, and general care of our city's parks. Just this past Saturday, Partnerships for Parks and the It's My Park volunteer program supported cleanup projects in nearly 70 parks. These volunteer efforts can be mobilized quickly because they're part of an existing network of nearly 600 volunteer groups and 26,000 individual volunteers from all 51 council districts that Partnerships for Parks has cultivated and supported for many years. The council's own parks equity initiative is making that network possible by funding regular coaching and capacity building for those volunteer groups, micro grants, and access to staff who can facilitate connections for those volunteers with the parks department and with the wider community. This network of 600 groups has more than doubled in size since Parks Equity Initiative funding started six years ago. But volunteers are not a long-term solution to park maintenance. This spring, City Parks Foundation joined with more than 30 conservancies and park stewards to form the Parks and Open Space Partner Coalition to collaborate and share resources. We worked together to raise money to create the $5 million New York City Green Relief and Recovery Fund which is distributing grants to help maintain green spaces. But this temporary funding is a drop in the bucket and is also not a long-term solution. The pandemic and the city's budget cuts are simply magnifying long-term disparities, which have all been discussed today. In the long-term, we have to rethink planning for and maintenance of our city's parks, plazas, gardens, natural areas, green streets, and NYCHA spaces as a comprehensive network of open spaces that meet the health, safety, economic, and environmental needs of communities. And we need to think about alternative funding such as mill taxes or park impact fees. The Seattle Park District, which collects a dedicated tax to support the city's parks department, now invests 62% more per capita than New York City does. But in the short term, New York City must recognize parks as the essential infrastructure that they are and provide funding, not the 0.6% of the budget that they get now, but truly adequate funding to ensure that our parks are safe and well-maintained for everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today at this incredibly important hearing and thank you for supporting City Parks Foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Owen of the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club, followed by Tommy Loeb. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Owen Foote. I'm uh, a 21-year uh, member of the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club, and thank you for accepting my testimony. Our waterfront programs, uh, as many of you might have uh, suspected, increased it by 400% this season, and more popular than we've been in the last two decades due to the uh, response to COVID-19, and we expanded our programs, particularly because our canoe feeds are uh, seven foot of separation, and we offer contact both with uh, nature next to our uh, contaminated water bodies of uh, New York Harbor. Uh, almost all of our participants have been uh, lower income residents who did not have access to a retreat or summer house outside of New York. So I uh, hope the council will start to think of this as a resource um, in our uh, city that our waterfront parks need to have access on and off the water. However, um, today, we're uh, talking about two separate things. First, we understand COVID-19 has produced record profits for Amazon and Whole Foods. Yet, after two years of complaint, our low-income neighborhood of mostly non-white residents has an esplanade adjacent to the parking lot here on the Gowanus waterfront with not one of the multiple drinking fountains in any operation at all. In addition, today and many other days, I was just there earlier, uh, the entrance gate is locked to the public, so we can't even get on to the uh, shoreline easily without going uh, over hurdles. However, the main reason why I joined this call is really to ask for New York City Council to require parks and recreation to add life-saving throw rings to shoreline esplanades and parks. 
Currently, such devices are exclusive to the majority white, mostly upper income neighborhood of Battery Park City. We don't think that represents the recent goals of ensuring equity in city parks. And we ask our city council to take action before the terms expire next year to ensure that waterfront parks not only have access on and off the water, but they also have these uh, 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 essential life-saving devices that we see on waterfronts throughout our country. Most notably, I would say uh, Baltimore Harbor has the uh, best example of uh, such devices, but really multiple waterfronts all over the country have them. Why not New York? I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we'll just move on to uh, Tommy Loeb, followed by Karsten Glazer. Time begins now. There you go, thank you. Uh, I'm a resident of the Lower East Side, and as many of you know, the city council approved last year a $1.45 billion plan for coastal resiliency. That after the community had come up after several years for a plan that cost half that amount, a little over $700 million. So I'm here to offer the city council $750 million in capital funds that are not needed. The, the community plan would have addressed the single most important issue, and that was protection from a Sandy type event. We came up with a plan that would have only uh, destroyed approximately 30% of the existing park. The city, after non-consultation with anybody, came up with a plan that not only addressed the Sandy type event, but addressed sea level rise, which won't come for many, many years. So we've uh, been asking this, as you mentioned, as a community of color, has no this is the largest park, East River Park is the largest park south of Central Park, and we don't feel this is equitable. During COVID and during, there's currently a resiliency plan going on in almost each one of the NYCHA residences. So during COVID, we have no access to open space, and the city is basically squandering $700 million. Well, we've been asking the city council and the mayor and now the governor to do is to put into place an independent consultant similar to the L train project, where after review, the city found that the existing project could be done faster and cheaper. We think the same should be done here. This project has never been reviewed by outside consultants. The one opportunity there was when the borough president brought in a, an outside consultant the city hid critical documents from the consultant, which he uh, uh, indicated in his final report. He also had some critical objections to the existing plan, including that the city plans to destroy the entire park, including eight, more than 900 mature trees and raise it by eight feet. The independent consultant said the city's plan was two feet short of what will be required possibly in the next 50 years. So the city is spending $1.5 billion on a plan which they may have to redo in 50 years. And at the same time, removing an entire park from the community for a minimum of five years and providing us with no flood protection during the interim. This is crazy and the council should investigate this because there's $750 million available to you if you look into this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Carson Glazer, followed by Kele and Kaharyani, and I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly, followed by Susan Donahue. Time begins. Okay, am I unmuted? Very good. Can you hear me, uh, Chris? We hear you. Yes, good. we can hear you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chairman Ku and others gathered here this morning. Thanks for the invitation to share my thoughts and experience with you on matters pertaining to the future of parks operation 
and its impacts uh, to green space expansion and conservation amid agency budget cuts. My name is Karsten Glazer. I'm an urban tree expert and horticulturalist and operate a Queens-based horticultural consulting firm. I'm an ISA certified arborist, a member of the New York State Arborist Association and of the American Society of Consulting Arborists. I have a PhD in plant science from CUNY grad, also served 14 year period between eight 1980s and the 1990s with parks in the area of horticulture and arboriculture maintenance and operations. As already documented today and stated, it is well documented by empirical studies and peer review publications that green space is populated by large trees and parkland and plazas, offer direct quantifiable benefits and services to people and is known to improve their health, the psychological well being and good feelings, and improve longevity, an increase in work productivity, to name a few. In the environment, that includes daily amelioration of the polluted air that we breathe, the interception of toxic gases and particulate matter, as well as the interception and diversion of stormwater that ensures slow infiltration back into the local aquatic environment, and using green to cool the gray amid a climate change concerns. Most important, it has shown significant improvement in the cognitive learning ability of school-aged children visually exposed to green space with trees in contrast to those schools that lack visually uh, green space and with poor student performance. Amid cuts to the agent, agency, the first group of employees to go is not the mid-level bureaucrats and administrators, but to m &O and the skilled personnel that maintain the green spaces, the laborers, gardeners, resource managers and foresters, and agency tree care arborists. I am witness to the calamity that occurred uh, to Parkland in 1970 through budget cuts. As a parks horticulturalist in 1980s, I saw a period of park and green space transformation uh, from a decade of horribly bad going into good by budget restoration and private public partnerships as already uh, stated by others. Uh, also a new renewed interest in urban greening through a rise uh, in attention to urban forestry. Experience firsthand is what parkland can and will look like after only a few years of even modest budget cuts. We're now beginning to see a very repeat of that time in various parks of course across Queens by increased illegal dumping, vandalism, criminal homicide, robbery, and parks maintenance diminishment that we wish not return. However, as both a recipient and observer of the services delivered by the agency, I have reservations about the assumed effective management deliverables required to maintain the Time is expired. I prompt this committee amid the discussion on agency budget to improve its vetting and oversight of the agency. Thank you. Thank you. And council member Holden does have a question. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karsten, uh, by the way, and uh, I want to thank you for your decades of service to the city of New York uh, on uh, certainly uh, horticulture and especially street trees. I want to ask you a question about uh, uh, the recent tropical storm that we had that knocked out so many trees and power lines um, in the city of New York. And uh, in my district, we had people out of power for two weeks, thanks to these uh, trees that were essentially diseased um, and the point of um, that they fell in the tropical storm and so many fell. Um, what would you say is the, um, what, what course should the city take going forward with their, their street trees to prevent this from happening again? Well, so many trees taking out power lines. Yeah, um, on the last uh, hearing regarding the storm and trees and power outage, um, I think Commissioner Liam Kavanaugh erred in stating that uh, they've got all the inspections covered. And what I'm seeing, even by, uh, uh, on, on a matter that even a novice could partake in is testing trees for their uh, decay uh, and they're, they're prone to failure because of that decay as we saw in Sandy, right up till uh, the storm uh, this, this season. Um, I, I really think so, if, any, if you were gonna put any emphasis on or weight on parks about uh, why trees fail. It has to do with tree health and condition. And, and I'm actually 
and, and you and, and Councilman Koo and others should be appalled by the level of tree failures, entire tree failures and branch failures that upon examination had decay in it that existed for years. Um, and that's that all goes back to inspections. And um, maybe it's poor training or lack of oversight on the, the inspection protocols under central forestry and the borough foresters. Um, maybe there's training that's lacking in their ability to carry that out. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, little by little we'll eventually lose all those decaying trees, but there are others out there that are experienced similar decay. It's a natural process within trees, often aided by uh, human activity, construction damage and wounding uh, during the life of the tree. Um, you know, 10 years can go by and um, no one knows the difference until the next storm comes. Yeah. So, yeah, so inspections. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Kele and Kaharianye, and apologies if I did not pronounce that correctly. Time begins. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Ku and the Committee on Parks and Recreation members. Thank you for your leadership in advancing uh, open space in New York City. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Kile William Karea Nyekile. I am from Williams Avenue Community Garden in East New York. The impact of COVID-19 in our city has been a physical, mental, and financial. This impact has affected low income and minority communities hardest. The city has taught open space as part of New York, New York City COVID-19 recovery. New Yorkers are looking for their parks and open spaces as resource and one of the few safe, safe spaces for activities. The 14% 14, 14 cut of parks budget during the most critical time for open space makes no sense and is anti-ethical to parks equity. Many of these cuts will directly impact access to and maintenance of our parks and garden, especially in low income communities that are also hardest hit by COVID-19. New York restoration projects like many open space organizations rely on park equity initiative funds to steward gardens and build open space for New Yorkers in the least uh, green neighborhood. We work in communities that do not have support of resource conservation, volunteer stewardship groups. So cuts to publicly funded programs like P P E I and Greener New York initiative hit doubly hard. The city need to prioritize projects that expand access to open space and deliver critical maintenance to, to highly used sites. Delaying this project means delaying our ability to properly address food insecurity, access to green spaces and critically maintenance of all which speak tr true park equity. We ask that the council please work with us to, to fund open spaces initiative and, st and stick necessary projects so that we can truly be part of New Yorkers, New York City's COVID-19 recovery. As a, an activist and somebody who's benefiting from the garden, I hope that city council will hear our cry because we really need those open spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now hear from Susan Donnelly from Prospect Park Alliance, who is our last registered panelist. Time begins.
great. Excellent. Thank you, Chair Ku and all committee members. My name is Sue Donahue. I'm president of the Prospect Park Alliance, the nonprofit organization that helps to maintain Prospect Park in partnership with the city. COVID-19 has made it resoundingly clear that parks and open spaces are essential to the well-being of our communities. <laughs> Prospect Park is truly Brooklyn's backyard and welcomes more than 10 million visits each year from every zip code in Brooklyn and beyond. As a community park, Prospect Park is a critical gathering space for family reunions, birthday parties, and all manners of picnics and barbecues. Right. It's, it's 585 acres provide fresh air and respite to Brooklyn residents who have the least amount of green space per capita in all of New York City. Making Prospect Park a welcoming and accessible space for the diverse communities of Brooklyn is a key part of our mission. And without the support of the city and our elected officials, our work would not be possible. Visitorship to city parks, as we've heard uh, through this testimony during the pandemic has increased significantly. In Prospect Park, we're seeing a record number of visitors at all hours and all days, along with numerous events and gatherings and a significant uptick in park patrons exploring every inch of the park, including more fragile areas such as the park's woodlands. At the same time, we're experiencing significant budget cuts and the Prospect Park Alliance relies on the city of the New York City Parks Department for general maintenance and upkeep of the park. Historically, the Parks Department budget has been a very small percentage of the city budget, despite the fact that parks comprise a large percentage of city land and are used by such a significant portion of the population. Since the pandemic, the Parks Department has experienced 84 million in cuts, as others have talked about, about 14% of its total annual budget of 587 million. The department has 45% less staff to handle more work and maintenance hours, which have been reduced by 25,000 hours a week. In Prospect Park, we've seen a 20% decrease in New York City park staffing, which has been further challenged by fatigue among the remaining staff, resulting in an increase in call-outs and absences. In addition, the Prospect Park Alliance also has, uh, by necessity, seen cuts to our budget due to the pandemic, with 11% in staff reductions, which has left us unable to fill open positions and required cutting our parade ground maintenance crew and nighttime summer weekend cleaning crew. Prospect Park Alliance has attempted to make up for this decrease in funded by funding by launching new volunteer programs, including a series of very successful It's My Park Days and the launch of a Green and Go Kit program, which provides patrons with trash grabbers, gloves, and bags. The response, thankfully, has been overwhelming from the community and demonstrates how much New Yorkers love their parks. But it's not a sustainable approach to maintaining Time our has parks. Expired. We applaud the City Council for taking up this issue and hope to work with you and our Parks and Open Space partners to advocate for increased funding for parks, leading to increased equity for all parks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. At this point, if we had, have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom hand function and you'll be called in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing none at this point, I will then ask Chair Ku to offer some closing remarks and adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Silva and his staff for coming here to testify. And thank you for all the public participations. And thank you. Uh, for all of you come today. As many have stated today, investing in our parks is more important than ever. And we must make sure that we are also investing in communities for the long term. We must work to address historic inequity in our park system and look for creative ways that we can increase access to open spaces moving forward. We must do so to combat COVID, but we also for the health of the residents in our city. Thank you for, for everyone again uh, for coming to testify today. Thank you to my committee staff and my own staff. And with that, I adjourn the meeting.